uh, so I think it's time to start. Uh, good morning, welcome to the IBDAS final event. Uh, before we start, I would like to inform you that the session is being recorded. Uh, my name is Desmina Kopanaki. I'm a project manager at Forth and a member of the IBDAS coordination team. On behalf of the IBDAS consortium, I would like to thank you for participating in our final event. A few housekeeping rules before we start. Uh, you are all muted by default. If you want to ask a question, you can use the Q&A panel at the bottom of your screen or raise the hand and we will unmute you. Uh, you can pose your questions at any time and the speakers will be more than happy uh, to reply back to you via text or answer live during the Q&A session at the end of this event. Uh, in case you experience any technical issue, please contact the session facilitator, Dr. Andreas Miodakis. Uh, okay, to start with, uh, we would like to ask you a few questions to understand the kind of audience uh, we have uh, with us today. Uh, a pop-up window should appear in your screen where you can answer uh, directly. Andrea, uh, perhaps you can uh, uh, start the poll. Uh, you will have around two to three minutes uh, for this poll. It is four questions and at the end uh, we will see the results. Uh, so, in the meantime, I would like to introduce uh, today's speakers, uh, Professor Sotiris Ioannidis. Uh, Sotiris is an associate professor at the Technical University of Crete and also affiliated researcher with the Foundation for Research and Technology uh, in Greece. Sotiris is the IBDAS project coordinator. Uh, we are honored to have today with us Nuria De Lama, our invited speaker. Nuria is a European Programs Manager in ATOS and also a member of the Board of Directors uh, in the Big Data Value Association. Nuria is also a member of the IBDAS External Advisory Board. Uh, Professor Dusan Jakovetic. Dusan is an Associate Professor uh, at the Faculty of Sciences, uh, University of Novi Sad in Serbia, and he is also the IBDAS Scientific and Technical Manager. Uh, Dr. Ramon de Pozuelo. Uh, Ramon is a project manager at Security Innovation and Transformation in Kaisa Bank. And for the IBDAS, Ramon is working on the financial pilot. Dr. Ioannis Arapakis. Ioannis is a researcher at Telefonica. And for IBDAS, uh, he is working on the telecom pilot. Giuseppe Danilo Spenacchio. Danilo is a flexible and adaptive system specialist at the Factor Innovation Department of CRF in Italy. And for the IBDAS, he's working on the manufacturing pilot. Dr. Vasilis Hadzianakis is a technical manager at ITML in Greece, and he's also the IBDAS integration manager. Dr. Hernan Rizzo Cambo. Uh, Hernan is a project manager at the Col de Pont Business School in Paris, in France. Uh, Hernan is a member of the work package that is leading the exploitation, sustainability, and business continuity activities of the IBDAS solution. So, after three years of research and innovation, uh, the IBDAS experts are ready to showcase the third and final version of the IBDAS solution and its application to eight real uh, world industry led experiments in the domains of banking, manufacturing, and telecommunication, uh, so as to ensure further adoption and to boost the exploitation of the project results and its sustainability. Uh, so, I would like now to guide you on today's agenda. After this introduction, Nuria De Lama will follow with uh, the keynote titled A Five Years Journey Through the European Big Data Landscape. After that, Professor Ioannidis will present the IBDAS overview. Uh, Professor Jakovetic will follow with a scientific and technical view of the IBDAS platform. Uh, then the three pilots will demonstrate in a step-by-step -step fashion the IBDAS solution and, and its application to the targeted sectors while focusing on the requirements set at the beginning of the project uh, then, Dr. Hadzianakis will demonstrate the expert and the self-service mode of the IBDAS platform and the overall uh, platform. Dr. Ocampo will present the IBDAS innovation ecosystem and the business and commercial offering. And the event will conclude the Q&A session. Uh, so, before we start, uh, I think that uh, I can see the results. Uh, people are answering. Uh, okay, 80% from Research and Academia. Andrea, uh, I think we can now close the poll. Okay. If you, I can see the results. I see that uh, the majority is coming from Research and Academia. 17% uh, uh, big data technology providers. 51% uh, is working with big data, 
uh, uh, 46% uh, are interested uh, in um, uh, big data technologies to optimize your customer experience. And regarding uh, the main barrier of risk preventing you from implementing uh, big data analytical solution in your organization, we see here that the 56% it's due to lack of experience uh, and then 22% is for cost and another 22 for uh, uncertain value. Thank you all for your votes. And now without uh, any further delay, it is, our, it is time for our keynote. I would like to welcome Nuria De Lama. Uh, Nuria has worked more than 20 years in research, development and innovation in different IT environments. Since 2010, she is a European Progress Manager at Atos, uh, where she coordinates the strategy of Atos research and innovation in European programs with a special focus on ICT. She was one of the founders of the Future Internet Partnership, uh, which gave birth to the Fireware Foundation. She was also one of the founders of the Big Data Value Association. And since 2018, she is a member of the Board of Directors. She is currently involved in several projects in the data ecosystem and data uh, transformation. Uh, she has been supported several projects, including uh, IBITAS, we are likely to have here, uh, just a comment, Nuria will not be able to attend the whole event, so please pose your question during her talk, and he will reply right after the end. So, Nuria, thank you for accepting the invitation. The floor is yours. I will now stop sharing my screen. Thank you very much, Despina. I will start sharing my screen, and you tell me when you can mm -hmm. see the presentation. We can see your screen. Okay. Um, oop. And, and can you see me? Yes. I will keep the video. Let's see if the internet connection works well. And then if uh, you detect any problem, you tell me, I will switch up of the video course. and then I will restart it later. Yeah, today I have a tricky logistics environment. Let's call it like that. Well, first of all, thank you very much for the invitation to be here in your final event. I'm really honored to be here. It's been a, a pleasure working together with you during these three years. And I think that you are one of the very good projects in the big data value uh, public-private partnership. So I'm really honored uh, again to be part of your advisory board and to be in your event today. And when you asked me to make the presentation, I was not sure about how to focus this speech because I didn't want to talk a lot. I wanted more to have a discussion with you. I know this is not so easy nowadays because of the pandemic and now we cannot interact with each other. But in any case, I wouldn't like to talk for so much time and I would really welcome some questions at the end of the presentation so that we can discuss a bit and maybe introduce some of the topics you will um, bring later in your presentations of the IBDAS project. In any case, I decided to focus the presentation on a kind of overview of what has happened in the European big data landscape. I thought that would be quite nice uh, to put in perspective what you are doing and what uh, all the projects are doing in, in Europe in big data to understand what was the starting point, what was the motivation to create this program around big data technologies, and also to understand a bit where we are nowadays. I think that measuring things is quite important because it allows us to have a reference to understand what was the beginning and also to understand if we made some impact with all these actions that we have put in place and on the last years. So basically, this is a way to congratulate the team to understand and put in perspective all the results to see where we were and where we are nowadays. And, and that's what I will try to do. I will not cover all the topics we could cover because then we would need to stay here for the full day. So I decided to focus just yes, on very few things. Uh, thanks a lot also for the introduction. I think Despina, you know more about me than myself. <laughs> so as you have said, I'm European Programs Manager at Atos Research and Innovation, and I'm also a member of the Board of Directors of the Big Data Value Association, which has given me also a good overview of what has happened in the last years. And just to start my presentation, I thought it would be good to understand where data relies in the overall context of data transformation. I think that most of you, and also especially the colleagues that will tell about the use cases in IBDAS, uh, come from different application domains. And it's good to understand if big data is being applied to different vertical sectors, and what is the value of, of the data in the overall process of digital transformation. I'm not sure if you are aware that there is a project funded by DigiPro called Advanced Technologies for Industry, ATI, and I took this data from their data dashboard. I think it's quite interesting. What you see on the right side of my, of my slide is basically a number of key enabling technologies that play a role in digital transformation, where the European Commission is trying to assess 
what is the situation or the position of Europe with respect to other industries and basically how we are doing with the development of the different technologies. And I was curious about comparing where big data is in comparison to other technologies like robotics or artificial intelligence, Internet of Things or advanced manufacturing. And the results are quite curious, as you can see on the right side. I, I was quite surprised to see that big data was so much on the bottom of that uh, slide. But maybe something interesting to see is how we are in technology generation and how we are in technology uptake. I think Two the two dimensions are very, very important. On the one hand, generating technology, and on the other hand, being able to create an impact by adopting that technology in different application domains. So when we have a look at the technology generation, um, you can see on the down part, basically, what is the distribution of member states in the generation of big data technologies. And on the upper part, basically, what you see is the comparison of big data, where is big data, within the overall um, um, framework of advanced technologies, so all the technologies that you see on the right side of my slide. Uh, and basically what you can see there is that uh, most of the countries, more, most of the member states are somehow quite similar. Of course, you, there are differences. You see that there are different bubbles and they, each of them represent a different member state. But basically you see that there is a concentration, which means that there are not many differences between member states in terms of technology generation. However, when you go to technology uptake, that is completely different. And you see that there are even member states that appear in that measurement scale in the level zero and some others in the level 100. So this means that there are a huge dispersion in the way big data is being adopted by different member states and by different sectors. I think that is quite curious to see. When we have a look also at uh, what is the position of big data in terms of technology uptake, you see that um, we are better in adopting than in generating. And that is something that at least to me, it was a surprise because I thought it was just the opposite. So I think it's very good to have a look at that and to understand the difference between the different member states. And again, look at uh, the difference in adopting and generating and what is also the position of big data in comparison of other technologies in digital transformation. That gives us a quite a comprehensive picture, I would say. I don't know if you were all working on big data in 2016, probably that is the case, but um, that was my case. And at that time, you may remember that the European Commission started to give a lot of a lot of relevance to big data because they understood that data would transform the way we are living today and the way we are working today. And many business processes would change, but also the products and services we are having would change. After several years, we can see uh, that that was true. And uh, basically, in order to measure what was the situation of big data and also try to understand which are the variables and the factors that influence uh, the adoption of big data, they decided to start measuring and define some scenarios. And probably you have already seen this before because that, that has been presented many times by the European Data Market Monitoring Tool created by IDC and Open Evidence. Um, and in 2016, uh, they defined three scenarios that are still valid nowadays. And uh, there was the high growth scenario, basically Basically, this was the situation in which demand and pull were enabled by easy reuse of data and awareness of benefits. So basically, a lot of people generating technology, a lot of access to different data sets, and also a lot of adoption of these technologies to get value out of data. So that was like the high growth scenario, the one we would all wanted to have. Then there was the challenges scenario, more characterized by a fragmented market. So basically, a weak demand and low data availability. And then the baseline scenario that is a bit in the middle of the two of them. So I think that we are more in this one and the baseline scenario is still valid. But of course, what the Commission wanted was to increase the probability of getting a high growth scenario, making sure that we had a digital single market, that there was good availability and use and reuse of data, and also that the demand side was really asking for these technologies because they realize about the value of data and those technologies. And for this, what the Commission decided to do was to create a contractual arrangement with the Big Data Value Association and basically set up a public-private partnership on Big Data Value. What you see there, and maybe some of you were in this ceremony, it is nice to see now, as I mentioned in the beginning of my presentation, things in perspective and understand how many years have already passed and how much work we have done along these years. 
you see there the signature uh, ceremony between uh, the commissioner at that time, Nelly Cruz, and our president at that time of the Big Data Value Association, which was representing SMEs. And uh, you know, that was a, a very important milestone for us because that allowed us to secure um, investment by the European Commission on Big Data uh, Technologies. So that was a very important moment. And you, you see, it was 2014. So we've been working quite a lot of years already on this. But something that is also quite important is besides having a contractual partnership and putting money to do projects on that and develop the technologies, it's very important to measure, to measure what we are doing and to understand if we are really doing the right investments in the right things. So for this, uh, the Commission, through this data landscape.eu project, created a full uh, framework uh, with different indicators and with different dimensions. And uh, there are many more than the ones that I'm showing here, but I think it's good to have a look at these ones because basically we got indicators along all these years on all these uh, factors that you see here. And I'm not sure if you are aware of these numbers, but I will go through some of them today. So one of the important things that I think that we should highlight is basically the value of, uh, of the data economy uh, and the value of the data market. So what you see in indicator two is basically data companies, the supply and demand, understanding what is the number of data supplier companies, understanding what is the share of data supplier companies in terms of data users, the number of data user companies, the share of data user companies. And then a very important indicator is basically the data company's revenue, not only how many companies we have, but basically what is the revenue that they are getting. So all these things have been measured since uh, the year that I have mentioned before. Another element that is very much related to supply and demand alignment is also the business and economy. And for this, the commission together with this project decided to set up two major indicators. One of them is the value of the data market. The second one is the value of the data economy. And as you can see, all of them are composed by different sub indicators. Let's call that like that. Then another thing we are doing since then is basically measuring where Europe stands in comparison to other countries and basically in comparison to United States, to China and Japan, but also to some other countries. Today, we don't have time to go through all of that, but all this data exists. And if you're interested in that, just uh, uh, contact me and I will provide information to you. And then the last thing that I would, would like to mention here in terms of uh, this measuring this measurement framework is basically the indicators that have to go, that have to do with the workforce and skills. This is very important because um, it's not enough if we have the technologies, it's not enough if we realize that there is a value in those technologies, but we also need to have the people with the right skills that understand which data need to be used, uh, how these data have to be used, and uh, basically how to implement the projects in the different companies and organizations. And as you will see later on, basically, even though the number of professionals has been growing and growing, still we have a, a quite relevant skills gap in Europe, which is quite important to, to face if we really want to materialize the data economy in the future. So this is basically the measurement framework, which I think it's important to understand, to see, as I mentioned before, if we are really making the right investments in the right way. Besides the measurement framework, one important thing was basically uh, to create the framework to act, to react and to execute. And for this, as I mentioned, uh, the Commission created a big data value public public private partnership. And what you can see here is the overall ecosystem. So it provides an overview of who are the actors that are contributing to realize this data economy. And as you can see on the left side, we have the Big Data Value Association with a lot of working groups, a huge community that is contributing with technologies, with a conceptual framework, organizing events. But then we have on the right side also the projects, which are the ones that are getting the money basically to make sure that all the topics that we have highlighted the strategic research, innovation, and deployment agenda are materialized and are implemented. IBIDAS is one of the examples of the projects that have heavily contributed uh, towards the priorities that we define in our agenda. And basically, in this contractual partnership, we take decisions. The Commission puts money, also private industry has to invest in that, and uh, we create the conceptual framework and we measure the way we are basically implementing all these technologies that we consider important for the future of the data economy in Europe. So this provides the overall framework. What we've been doing since then, I think it's uh, important to say that we are not only working on technology, and what you see here is basically the vision that we define in the Big Data Value Association for 2020. As you can see, there are many different pillars, and uh, that includes, for example, access to data, which is a very important thing, the creation of technologies, 
And this brings me back again to the indicator that I mentioned before, where I don't know if that was a surprise to you or not, but basically Europe is doing quite bad in terms of technology generation in big data. So this is also one of the motivations of why we created a, the big data value public-private partnership, making sure that our industry would be more competitive in technology provision. Then societal aspects, because uh, we want to adopt technology. And of course, uh, you need to put the right framework to make sure that people will adopt and will accept those technologies. Then applications, understanding what are the needs from a functional and non-functional point of view, understanding what is the impact of uh, including big data technologies in the different application domains, in manufacturing, in transport, in bioeconomy, understanding the impact from a business and economic point of view, as we mentioned before, creating the legal and regulatory environment that will make possible that all these data economy aspects will really um, be materialized that requires a, also a governance structure. And finally, as I mentioned before, investing in skills, in creating the right uh, skills, people, uh, uh, pe people that understand what is the value of data with the right capacities and also the different instruments and infrastructures that are needed to make it possible. For all these, uh, more than 50 projects are part already of the big data value TPP, contributing to technology generation and uptake. And all these projects can be classified based on, on this uh, BDVA reference model that we defined already some years back. Here you can see basically a layer structure where we have identified which are the major aspects where technical projects should work. And as you can see, that involves data management, data pro protection, data processing architectures, data analytics, data visualization, and user-generated interaction, and of course, many cross-sectorial aspects that have to do with standards, security, and skills, as I mentioned before, without forgetting at any point in time the infrastructure aspects, for example, cloud, high-performance computing, edge computing, and also the data sources where we can find, for example, a lot of IoT developments. So this shows a holistic picture of all the technologies we've been working on and, and the ways of how they are classified. I will not talk about IBDAS today because I know there are many presentations today and you will see basically the different contributions that IBDAS has made to the different layers of this uh, reference model. And um, as I mentioned, there are different aspects we can talk about from a technical point of view, from a non-technical point of view, but today we don't have time to go through all of them. So I decided to focus specifically on one of them that I consider that is essential. I'm not saying it's the most important one, but I think in my opinion, that still requires some work, but but we have also made good progress in the last years. And I wanted to emphasize that, and maybe then the colleagues from IBDAS can uh, create some hooks between the presentations and uh, the contributions you have made, because I think that IBDAS has also been quite instrumental in showing and giving uh, access to data and showing the value of this data. In uh, 2018, Everis made uh, or conducted a study on B2B data sharing. And I think this was a bit of a starting point to realize with figures what was the situation in Europe about data sharing. And I think it was quite negative, I would say, if we really want to experience the benefits of the data economy. And uh, basically, 39%, according to these studies, with different companies of many different sectors, claim to share data at that time. We are talking about 2018, so it's not so long time ago. We are in 2020, so probably the situation has improved a bit, but not dramatically. Uh, and yes, 42% of companies at that time declared to reuse data. Uh, which I think is quite low, but if we have a look at the other figure, that's even worse. Only 25% of companies claim to both share and reuse data at that time in 2018. Going through companies working in transport, in mobility, manufacturing, in agriculture, public sector, so any kind of organization. So I think that that show basically that in Europe we, we were having important problems. It was not only having access to technologies to do data analytics or maybe data visualization, but we were having a, a very relevant project problem that was the, the starting point for all the others that was basically to get access to data. And, um, and this was uh, due to many different aspects. People thought in the very beginning that it was mainly because of technologies. But uh, what you can see on the right side is that basically, based on the answers to this survey, we realized that uh, there were many different uh, factors and elements that impacted the fact that companies were not using or reusing data, and many of them were not of technical nature. As you can see, some important ones were also liability, licensing, localization, skills, or legal aspects. I think that the lack of a governance framework with the right uh, rules 
to make sure that uh, data owners keep the control of their data. They know who is accessing their data, how this data is being used or reused. That was really a main barrier or drawback for companies to share use and reuse data. So that was a, a bit of starting point just two years ago. And even though we had already been working on the PPP to make sure that the data was really accessed in a heavier way, um, and then I, I think that, that that was a bit of starting point for the commission to invest in many different measurements and, and many different mechanisms to allow companies to share data. And not only companies, but also to make sure that the data that was available through public funding and public sources was also accessed and used by companies. And I have uh, decided to include here a couple of examples. Of course, there are many others. And in IBDAS, you have many others, of course. But I thought this was quite interesting. The first thing is that uh, you may have heard a lot about Copernicus um, and uh, and all the, the all the money that the European Commission has invested in the last years to make geospatial data available to companies. And precisely because um, data was available, but companies were not using this data, they decided to create a number of platforms, data access platforms, that were not only gathering the data, but basically processing the data, making them more usable by companies and creating added value services on top of the data, the raw data, to make um, basically the access to data and, and, and the functioning of data easier for companies. And for this, they created uh, the number of platforms that you see there. They are called DIAS platform. Um, and, and basically they give you, as I have mentioned, uh, access to added value services on top of your, your spatial data. So that was um, somehow a good initiative. I think that uh, since then uh, companies are using much more geospatial data, especially the ones that come directly from public funding from the European Commission, but also member states started to make a good effort in making data more available to companies, especially to SMEs and startups, but in general to companies that were not using data. And uh, this is a, an example of the data marketplace created by the Austrian government, where they really try to create an ecosystem of service providers, data providers, data users, brokers, basically making sure that the different companies were working together, that there was an infrastructure that could be used by companies where they could find different data analytic platforms, access to data, and also access to experimentation resources. So that shows also how these are not worries just yes, of the European Commission happening at the European level, but also the different member states started to realize that accessing data was also important for their economies. And they also set up different infrastructures and different platforms to help their companies to access and use data. So these are just a couple of examples on how to promote data sharing that have happened in the last years. Also in BDVA, and I think some of you have contributed specifically to this work, we have been um, working in a specific working group on data sharing spaces. Um, we have already published different documents. One of them was um, uh, published in November 2020. It was the second version of a position paper called Towards a European Governed Data Sharing Space. And I think that this has also given quite a lot of ideas on how to create a governance structure or a governance mechanism that um, allows companies to, to have a, a trusted environment. And for this, uh, we have considered different dimensions that you can see on the right side of my slide, which are not only related to technologies, but also related to, to data, how to make data interoperable, how to make data portable from one platform to another, to have the right governance structure, as I mentioned before, to take care of some aspects related to the to the people that are using the platform and to the organizations that are behind. So this was also a bit of our contribution from the Big Data Value Association to the data sharing space. And these aspects were taken very much into consideration because some of you following the European strategy on data have seen that basically there is a, a program called the Digital Europe Program that will start in 2021. And this program will focus on deployment and operation. And it will include specifically something called the European data spaces, which are basically the materialization of all these principles that we have put on the table in the last years. And for this, and probably you know this even better than me, uh, basically what the European Commission wants to do is to create the platforms, the technical tools uh, that will allow companies that have 
the data to share the data. In the very beginning, they will start doing this data sharing spaces more at sectorial level. So basically making sure that the different companies providing data and using data in the same sector can talk to each other, that data somehow can flow from one member state to another one, from one platform to another one, because here interoperability and portability are major aspects. And then I suppose that uh, what it will come is basically uh, more like the cross-sectorial aspects that will allow the different data spaces to talk to each other. So this is what will happen in the future. And basically, as I've mentioned, uh, they will try to implement many of the different pieces and pieces that we have put together along these years from a technological and non-technological point of view. And of course, IBDAS is one of the projects that has contributed with some technology to, to make this um, a reality, let's say like that. And this is a basically a very quick overview. I know it's very uh, it's a very quick one on what has happened in terms of data sharing. What was the situation in Europe? Very bad, as I have mentioned before. If we look at the indicators, also using the data platforms as a way to motivate and foster data sharing and putting all these building blocks that we have mentioned, ending up with this concept of the data sharing spaces that we are working on nowadays. But I think that something that is also quite important is uh, not only to make sure that data is available, which is, uh, as I have mentioned, in any case, the starting point to make sure that uh, then companies can really uh, get access to value, but, um, but also to understand how to use the data. And for this, the European Commission decided to set up four major projects that we call Lighthouse projects. So basically what we wanted to do is not only developing technology that was also very important as IBDAS has been doing, but also making sure that we were putting in place mechanisms to allow user companies, basically the ones that could use the data to create business value, that they could understand what this value was. And then uh, be able not so much to develop technologies for year 2020, 2025, or 2030, but to make sure that within the context of these projects, they had the mechanisms to deploy the technologies and to measure such impact. And basically, these, these lighthouse projects that were enormous were covering the full value chain in their sectors, and we have created four of these uh, big projects. One of them, one of them called Data Bio, focus on bioeconomy, then transforming transport, focus on transport and logistics. We had another one more focus on buy on um, manufacturing called Boost for Dot Zero, and then big medialytics on the area of health. So the four of them have been instrumental to show the value of data and also not only to talk about what could happen, but basically to measure what has happened when companies have a had access to data and have uh, created um, or have analyzed the data and have created applications on top of this data. And I think the Transforming Transport project is a quite good example of this uh, big impact that we have seen along the last years. And here you see a number of cases that they have developed uh, in many cases with very quantitative measurements on the, on the benefit that using the data has created for the different companies behind the use cases. And um, well, just to main to mention an example, you see there the, the rail infrastructure maintenance cost that has been reduced to 34%. I think is really a, a great reduction and it's a quite impressive um, quantitative indicator to show uh, somehow the way using this data has impacted a, a business process that was in place before, but with much worse uh, indicators from a quantitative point of view. So I think this is also important to show and to give evidence on how big data could be used and uh, what the benefits for the companies could be when using this data. Finally, people need to measure everything in order to understand what is the return on investment. So the project has allowed us also to go through all these use cases. And uh, later on in this uh, webinar, in this event, you will see also many very concrete use cases uh, created by the IVDAS project, where we see also very impressive indicators and very impressive results. So of course, I didn't want to include those ones because I know you will present them later on. Let me also summarize a bit some of the tools that we have created and that could also be used for, for the people in the audience today. And um, uh, maybe you have already seen these ones, uh, depending if you are already involved in this uh, public-private partnership or you are from outside the program. And uh, basically we have created something called the Big Data Landscape, where you can basically see which are the companies in Europe that are using this kind of technologies and that are producing this kind of technologies. And the main intention of this tool, the Big Data Landscape, is for you to understand who is who and to get in touch with the different stakeholders that could help you to collaborate and to create more value out of the data 
data you have. So things that you will see in this data landscape is not only the actors in Europe, but also, for example, which are the centers of excellence in Europe in big data in the different countries, which are the data-driven experimentation infrastructures that you can see in Europe. So basically, it's a compelling offering of what we have in Europe around big data. Probably not very, not completely um, uh, full, but uh, but of course, um, this is really open to all the actors that want to include the results there. And then we have something quite interesting, which is a uh, the big data marketplace, which is a, a kind of a one-stop shop where you can really search for innovations in big data. And I hope that uh, the IBDAS results are already included in, uh, in our marketplace because I think that is a, a very good window of visibility to all the results that uh, European companies have created in the last years. And um, basically it's a catalog where you can find any kind of result related to big data with different TRLs in different domains. And then uh, you can really use different search uh, criteria to look for different reference categories. You see there, for example, data analytics, data management, but you can also look for a solution that is especially useful in transport and mobility or for public sector with different readiness levels, as I have mentioned before. So basically it allows you to play quite a lot with different search criteria. And uh, we hope that this is really something useful to all the colleagues that are really wanting to collaborate with others and are wanting to reuse some of the results that have already been produced in the context of this partnership. Um, looking at the time, I think that I cannot go through all the details of this, but I thought it would be very good for you also to understand what has been the impact and what is the situation of Europe nowadays um, with respect to, to the indicators that I mentioned before. And for example, you can see that um, what you see on the left side is basically the key numbers. They are very much updated. They are numbers from 2019 that includes, for example, United Kingdom. So is the EU 27 plus UK. But if you go to the source, you will see also the comparison of EU 27 without UK. And you will also see what is the impact of the pandemic on these numbers. Of course, I could not include so many details here. What is also interesting is that I have decided to add you the, the projections for the baseline scenario. So basically the standard scenario where we understand there will be a digital single market, there will, there will be a good um, understanding of the value of data, but it's not the high growth scenario. This is the projection for the baseline scenario in 2025 for EU 27 without UK. So basically what you can see is that all the figures will be growing. So we can expect a good development. However, for me, what worries me a bit is that um, we have increased quite a lot in terms of data suppliers, also the revenues of data suppliers. This means that uh, we are developing more technology than the picture that I show in the very beginning. However, I see that the number of data users is not increasing to the same rhythm. So this shows that still there are a lot of challenges related to data adoption. And I have mentioned these Lighthouse projects before because I think that they illustrate quite well the value of big data in their different uh, operational domains. But still, this means that a lot of big companies and small companies do not understand what the value is, or at least when they create the return on investment assessments, they don't see very well what the return could be by using these technologies. I hope that today in the IBDAS webinar, you will also see like some concrete examples that could encourage some other companies in the sectors to adopt these technologies, because I think that in IBDAS, you've done quite good work on that. Um, so basically have a look at that when you have a bit of time and I think it's quite interesting to have a look at, at all these numbers. But I would like to finalize my presentation a bit with, uh, with the impact that we have created in the, in the partnership besides these numbers that are more macroeconomic numbers. And uh, for sure IBDAS is part of this team, part of the ecosystem, and uh, I think that uh, you should also get the credit on, on these results. It's important to mention that what I'm showing here comes from, um, from an analysis called the Monitoring Report 2018. So this means that uh, figures are from two years ago. I, of course, I wanted to show something more updated. The problem is that you know that uh, the process of creating the new monitoring report is happening just right now. And this will include uh, the updated figures of 2019, but we don't have them yet. And last year, this exercise was not run. So basically this is the most uh, updated um, a situation we have even though it is from two years ago. But what I think is quite impressive is to see that thanks to this partnership on big data value, basically we have mobilized more than one and a half billion euro. This is private investment mobilized thanks to the partnership. It doesn't include other sources. And you may remember that when we created this partnership, the main objective was to achieve a leverage factor of four which means that basically for each of the euros put on the table by the European Commission, 
private companies had to mobilize four euro or one euro of the commission for euro of private investment. And we have uh, created basically a leverage factor of eight, which means that we have achieved the double of the private investment that was envisaged in the very beginning when we signed the contractual partnership. The, the number of SMEs is also quite impressive. We have close to 30% of SMEs in the ecosystem. These 200 members is not updated. I think we are like 300 members now in the Big Data Value Association. And of course, many more in the partnerships because all of you working in the projects are part of the partnership. Um, the, the indicators for the SMEs are quite impressive, as I have mentioned, as well as the increase of the number of data companies creating technologies in Europe, data marketplaces, data platforms. And also you will see that there is a good contribution in terms to uh, how big data technologies have made an impact on environmental challenges. And if you go to the monitoring report, you will see, for example, very concrete examples on how these technologies have contributed to waste reduction or, for example, to energy efficiency. Something that is also quite interesting, we have created, and I talk again about 2018, 106 innovations. And of course, IBITAS is part of this. 39 of those ones with significant impact and 70 and 70, oh, sorry, 63% of them with medium impact. Also interesting to see that 53 uh, of them can be considered incremental innovation, while 38 of them can be considered disruptive innovation. But in general, what it is important is that the number of innovations has been really impressive thanks to this portfolio of projects and uh, many of them with an economic impact that was very important. You saw that from the very beginning, the idea was to improve the competitive position of our companies, both in terms of the generation of technologies, but also in terms of adopting technologies. And 93% of those have generated an economic impact. But we can also distinguish a 45% of applications that have had a societal impact, which is very important and in line with the new priorities of the European Commission of having a, a digital economy that uh, doesn't leave anyone behind. And uh, I will not go through these uh, slides, but I think it's also useful that you keep them as a um, backup because um, I mentioned before that data skills is also a quite important and relevant pillar for the development of the digital economy in Europe. And, um, and I think that also in this partnership, despite it was not the main focus, we have also made good impact on data skills. So as I did before for the data platforms and the data economy, basically I have included here the key numbers for 2019, including UK, but also the projections for the baseline scenario in 2025. What is interesting is to see that the number of data professionals has been growing and growing, but still we can consider that uh, the skills gap in Europe is quite relevant. So I hope that also IVIDAS will have very much in creating a lot of interest in students so that uh, our uh, skills base improves. So these are basically the contributions that the partnership has made in terms of skills. And again, I would like to reference this monitoring report where you can see all the details and the description of what has been created. And again, IVDAS has contributed to that. And also there is a, a compelling offer of uh, different applications that are at your disposal, the ones, the people from IVDAS, but also the people that are attending the final event today that you can use and we hope that you will use. And basically this set of tools include an education hub where you can find any offering related to big data in Europe, also a mobility program that helps you to understand which mechanisms can be used nowadays in Europe in order to make a changes between organizations. Also a skills recognition program that helps to understand if uh, the CVs, that the curricula that we are using now for students are really aligned with the, with the demands of the companies. And also you will find a lot of information about the big data centers of excellence in Europe, which uh, provide also a lot of infrastructure and a lot of capabilities that can help companies to understand on how to access technologies and get also guidance on how to use these technologies. And uh, finally, let me conclude my presentation with some words about the future. This is what we've been doing so far since 2014 that we realized that the re Europe really needed to react on this big data landscape. Then we put all these uh, measures in place. We created a partnership. We created a measurement framework that I have tried to explain even though very quickly, we created also an implementation framework with an agenda with uh, more than 50 projects that were supporting us in implementing that agenda. But this doesn't stop here. I have decided to focus the presentation more on the topic of data platforms and data availability, which is still a challenge for Europe, where I hope that uh, you will provide more insights from IVDAS today. But for sure, this is something where we 
still have to work in the future. And for this, and um, especially for those who have not been working with us in the last months, I would even say years, we are working very much on a future initiative called the AI Data and Robotics Partnership, which is basically an initiative that tries to build on all this work we've been doing in the Big Data Partnership that will formally finish in December 2020. So now in few days, it will formally finish. But um, as mentioned, there are still many challenges ahead of us. And basically, we are working on a new partnership that is more focused on the convergence of different technologies. And maybe this allows me to create a hook with the first slide I show, I show in my presentation that was showing the different key enabling technologies. And you've seen that basically we could see IoT, robotics, artificial intelligence. I think it's very difficult to focus just on data without considering the other technologies. And basically this new partnership focuses on the convergence of some of these technologies. We have done a bit like in the past with the big data PPP, and we have tried to understand where Europe stands in these technologies. And we have created what we call the strategic research, innovation and deployment agenda, where we have identified the priorities. I'm sure that some of you have also participated participated to this exercise of defining the priorities. And of course, in the upcoming years, I hope in many years, we will also try to implement uh, all these priorities that we have already identified as challenges for Europe. And as I mentioned before, it's quite curious to see that we've done a lot of progress, uh, that we have created good impact on Europe, and we have seen all these quantitative and qualitative indicators. Mm -hmm. But the reality is that uh, now we are talking about uh, AI applications, data is the is the oil or is needed in order for these AI applications to happen. And I think that data platforms, especially with respect to access to data, portability of data and interoperability of data will play a major role in making sure that AI will be possible in Europe and also in the European way. So I think that this uh, concludes my presentation and basically puts on the table the fact that despite all this progress, still a lot of challenges remain. I think that IBDAS has been a great contributor to all this, but that we still have to work very much in the coming years, build on the results that we have created along these uh, five years or more. And then uh, I hope that uh, the future will be brilliant for European companies in the years to come. So thank you very much for your attention. I'm available for your questions. and. Uh, I'm sorry to go so quickly, and I hope that in any case you will enjoy the slides later on when you have time to go carefully through the different indicators that I have presented. Thanks again for the opportunity to present this to you. Thank you so much, Nuria, for being here with us for this great talk. Actually, you prepared all the ground of what is, is going to follow, so many thanks again. Uh, we have two questions. Uh, let me uh, read them. Uh, dear Nuria, thank you for the great talk. Um, do you have any insights on the emphasis given on big data on the new Horizon program, Europe program? What is the vision for 2020-2027? Yeah, in fact, uh, I'm not sure if you had the opportunity to see the new World program, but it's already available. I think there is a new version of the World program for, um, for uh, the Horizon Europe. You know that now there will be two programs. That's important to say. There will be Horizon Europe as a continuation of the research and development program. And there will be Digital Europe, which is basically focused on, on deployment and operations, as I have mentioned before. You will see that there are lots of topics related to data. And now I don't talk about big data. I think it's more like data economy in general in both programs. And uh, you will see a lot of emphasis on these data spaces that I have tried to describe, even though very quickly, on data platforms, data availability, data interoperability. And also one aspect that uh, I didn't have time to go through in this presentation, but is the one of infrastructures. I have read in several reports that one of the reasons why maybe the data economy is not going as fast as needed in Europe is the lack of a suitable European infrastructure something that allows you not only to get access to data but to make sure that data is interoperable and uh, and that you can use cloud computing edge computing hpc if you need this kind of infrastructure in a more sovereign way and making sure that data is interoperable and portable between platforms and uh, the number the name of this potential infrastructure is gaia x i'm not sure if you are aware of this but um but i think that we will hear a lot about gaia x in the future years and in terms, of, again, of the program, I think that data platforms, data availability, data spaces will be a, a major a major pillar in the next funding programs. But still, don't worry, there will be a lot of money for research on, on different data analytics, data visualization, data processing capabilities. So, so a lot of that is in the work program still for the upcoming years. Great. 
Uh, thank you. Uh, the next question. Uh, thank you for the great talk. Uh, in your opinion, what do you think will be the game changer for convincing data owners to share more data, especially for research and development? I think that it's always the same. I'm making sure that, first of all, that if data is so important for everyone and you are the owner of the data, you want to be sure that you keep the control of your data. <laughs> so if it is a competitive advantage for you, you may be willing to share that not with everyone, with some people for different reasons, but uh, but of course you want to be you want to have the control to decide who will access your data, when they can access your data, for which purpose, and and to be able to control the way this is really happening. It's not only that I put the rules in the beginning, but that I can monitor if these rules are being um, somehow fulfilled. So for this, we need this governance model that we are working on. And uh, again, this Gaia X initiative is working very much on that, on making sure that this um, control of the data by the data owners happened, and that, that you really are, you have the data sovereignty, as we call it, basically. So I think that is very, very important when companies understand that they have the right mechanisms, technologies, and the regulatory framework that allows them to keep the control of data and to be sure who is accessing and in which way this access is happening, then um, I, I think that we will progress quite a lot. I hope so. Okay. And, I again, like... as I mentioned before, interoperability, of course, making sure that uh, that data from different sources can be used, that can be used by different players with different platforms, and portability, making sure that there is no vendor locking. Mm -hmm. Great. Um, okay. I would like now invite Sotiris uh, in case uh, he wants to ask Nuria something. Hi. Hi, Nuria. Thanks for the presentation. Uh, See, uh, I have special privilege as I am the coordinator, so I, I get to ask, ask my question. However, I think you actually probably already answered it, but my question was about how do you practically get control over your own data? Because yes, in theory, we can have governance and all that nice stuff, and maybe it can apply to companies, but how do individuals practically get control over their own data? Um, that's that's difficult to answer because I think that the solutions are not there yet, but uh, basically that's the next step and that is what we are working on. Of course, there are different proposals on the table, but uh, I think that this is not uh, fully decided and we need to work a bit uh, more on that. It's a, it's a very hard problem. Yeah, it's a very difficult problem, but I think there will be solutions in the upcoming years. I don't know if you know about the developments of the International Data Spaces Association. It is one of the main players that also counts on the support of many companies. My company is also contributing to that one. And uh, of course, they already have a model which is being applied also by this Gaia X initiative, but uh, probably it's not the only one. There are different approaches to that. And, and, and we will see in the next years, basically what is the, the winning option or the winning options in plural. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I think uh, Nuria replied to, to the questions. Uh, I would like to thank you once again on behalf of the whole consortium. Uh, you helped a lot of us during the, the three years that uh, you were a member of the external advisory board. Uh, so again, many thanks for being here today with us. It was I think you've pleasure. made an amazing work, really. As advisory, as member of the advisory board, I'm really honored to be with you. And I think that uh, your project is a good example on how to combine the two things, really generating a lot of interesting technology, but then making sure that this is not just a theoretical thing and that it, it's been put in practice in very concrete use cases that you have even measured. And today we will learn a bit more about that. So I really congratulate all of you for that work. Also, don't forget we have Marvel, so we have three more years of working together. <laughs> You're not getting away so easily. No, 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 no. I don't want to do that. <laughs> <laughs> Great. Okay, I think we should uh, move on to the, the next presentation. Okay, I would like to uh, present our next speaker, Professor Sotiris Ironidis. Uh, he's currently an associate professor at the School of Electrical and Computer Engineering of the Technical University of Crete. Uh, he was a research director at the Foundation for Research and Technology until 20, 2020, and now he is affiliated researcher. Uh, he received his PhD from the University of uh, Pennsylvania in Computer and Information Science. Uh, he has been the PI of uh, 40 European national and DARPA projects. Uh, his research interests are in the area of systems and network security, security policy, privacy, and high-speed networks. He has authored more than 200 publica publications in international conferences and journals. And as you know, is, he is the IBDAS project coordinator. So, Thierry, the floor is yours. Thank you, Despina.
Uh, let me see how I can share this. Yes, you can see the slides now. Okay. So, uh, thank you all for attending. Um, I think Noria basically covered uh, half the things I wanted to say, which is a good thing. So um, she's saving me uh, 20 minutes from my 10 minute talk. Uh, I just wanna, maybe if I can get it to work. I just wanna mention a couple of things uh, as an intro. Uh, we do live in the big data era. Uh, Nuria motivated that very, very well. Um, uh, there's a diversity of sources that we get data from continuously. Uh, but the interesting thing here is that uh, we get the value out of the variety of data, not necessarily out of the volume. So this is quite important. I'm not gonna you know, try to motivate things. Uh, I think Nuria, for example, presented things about uh, the data economy, whatnot. So I'm gonna jump over the motivation and, and, and go directly into the, uh, the project because we need to save some time. Um, but uh, I'm gonna start with the overview of the project, who we are, uh, talk about the objectives, about the, the use case, and then pass on the floor to our technical lead where they you know, can talk more about the architecture and, uh, uh, and the pilots. So the project has uh, 13 partners um, uh, between industry and academia. Actually, we have a very well balanced consortium between SMEs, uh, big industry, research centers, and uh, universities. We started uh, about three years ago. Uh, so it's been a, you know, a long way. Uh, we had a fair amount of budget, um, about 5 million euros, and uh, the project was a, a research and innovation action, which basically means that we primarily focus on the uh, research aspect of things, uh, and not necessarily that much on the um, uh, product side of things. However, a lot of new tools and a lot of new technologies came out of the project, which are actually being uh, applied by... Uh, uh, the SMEs and the big industry players in the in the consortium. I'm going to jump straight into the vision of uh, of the IBDAS project. So uh, I'm going to split it into two parts. Uh, primarily, wanted to create um, an environment uh, that is uh, uh, a safe space to do uh, big data experimentation. So that was the primary goal of the. Of the project, so something that people can, you know, go in there and learn and do things. Uh, and the other is to uh, create tools that enable non-experts uh, to uh, play with big data technologies, uh, do analytics on 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 the information they collect from their sensors or from uh, online, uh, and try to get value out of that. Uh, with these two aspects, we want to increase the uh, the impact uh, of uh, of the project. Um, to the entire uh, to, to the entire Europe. Now, to do this, um, uh, of course, we wanted to uh, build new tools and services uh, for uh, for big data. Uh, we wanted to uh, create tools that are be, that are able to process data very fast, uh, merge it, you know, do interesting things on it, uh, so that we can uh, do things in real time. And of course, we want to be able to do this on heterogeneous infrastructures. Uh, have things like elasticity and so on and so forth. So uh, uh, some things on the big picture and some practical things on, on the other end of the spectrum. Uh, in one sentence, and it's a long sentence, I know, uh, the project IBDAS aims to empower users to easily utilize and interact with big data technologies by designing, building, and demonstrating a unified framework that does the following. Significantly increases the speed of data analytics while coping with the rate of data asset growth and facilitate cross domain cross flow towards a thriving data driven EU economy. Again, I understand this is a mouthful, but I think it encapsulates exactly the, uh, the ideas and vision behind, uh, uh, behind uh, IBDAS. Now, whatever we do and whatever we did, we wanted to validate it. And that's why we have uh, a number of industry led experiments, we call them. Uh, or a lot, of, a lot of different pilots that we run uh, throughout uh, the course of the three years to validate uh, every tool and every service that we build. This big statement that uh, I just uh, read you, I guess, uh, can be broken down into uh, smaller objectives. And you're gonna see how these objectives were met uh, after you see the, uh, the overall architecture and, uh, and the pilots. 
but uh, I'm gonna just focus on two of them here. Uh, the, the big data solution as a self-service. So everything that we built, we wanted to be able to be, uh, to be used by, by pretty much anyone that of course has some experience with, uh, uh, with computers, not someone that has no idea about anything, uh, but we wanna make it easy for them. And the other thing is that we wanted to uh, break silos. We wanted to make data available uh, across uh, organizations, for example, but also within the same organization. Sometimes we have silos even within uh, the same organization. So these are the, the, the two more uh, important objectives of the project. Now, uh, a bit about the, uh, the pilots. Uh, we had three different uh, uh, industries that uh, participated in, uh, in IBIDAS. Uh, CRF was focusing um, on, uh, on manufacturing uh, and on uh, predictive maintenance, for example, of their, uh, of their equipment. But Kaisha Bank, uh, which focused on the security of their um, online banking and payments and whatnot, and Telefonica Telecommunications that focused on uh, uh, how you deploy equipment and how you monitor the quality of, of data centers. And you're gonna see more about this uh, in the in, in demos in the remaining of this, uh, of this uh, event. Now, even though we had three main targets, three main target domains within the uh, project as, as proof of concept, let's call it in the project, the ideas of IBIDAS, we wanted to uh, apply to a lot more um, diverse domains. So we want them to apply to health, uh, defense, uh, and so on and so forth. And uh, I think that IBIT has actually accomplished this. We also have some you know, more generic uh, pilots and more ex and generic experiments that we show that our technologies do apply in other domains as well. So with this, uh, I wanna leave you with uh, some information about where you can find us and follow us. Uh, we have the information of the, of the project, of course, online, but you can also follow us on Twitter and LinkedIn. Uh, so uh, I'll be happy to take any of your questions, although this was just a, an introductory talk and the more interesting things happen uh, after my presentation. So thank you very much. Thank you, Sotiris, for your great talk. Uh, I think uh, we will continue with uh, the next speaker, uh, Dr. Dusan Jakovetic. Uh, an introduction to Dushan. Uh, he is an associate professor at the Department of Mathematics and Informatics in Faculty of Sciences, University of Novi Sad in Serbia, and he is also the IBIDAS Scientific and Technical Manager. Uh, he received uh, his PhD in Electrical and Computer Engineering from Carnia Mellon University in Pittsburgh and uh, Instituto de Sistemas Robotica in Portugal. Uh, he works as a Scientific and Technical Coordinator in several H2020 projects. Uh, his research interests include data analytics, optimization, signal processing for distributed systems. Uh, Dusan, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Despina, for the introduction. Um, I hope that you can see uh, my slides in the full screen. Yes. Great. Uh, so I'm going to provide a, a, an overview, a scientific and technical overview of the EBITDA's project. Um, so, so this is... Uh, uh, this is an outline of, uh, of uh, what I will be talking about. So we will start from describing the IBIDAS solution. And, uh, and this is what Sotiris mentioned, that, uh, that the IBIDAS provides a big data as a self-service solution. So this is an end-to-end -end, uh, big data platform. So we are, we are first going to present uh, uh, it from the sort of from the front end, what it offers to end users. Uh, then we are going to, uh, to present it uh, from the back end. What are the technologies that, that we develop and integrate so that we make these uh, big data functionalities to end users available? Then I'm going to go over uh, some highlights and, and innovations of the EBITDA's project. Um, as, um, and, and, and mentioned that some of them um, have been uh, promoted by EU uh, actually as excellent innovations, but they are also available in the BDVA innovation marketplace that Nuria mentioned. Uh, then uh, I'm going to, to give an overview of, of the activities within the project that we had uh, with respect to breaking data silos, data sharing, and so forth. Um, actually, there, there has been lots of uh, uh, work by the data providers and, and, and a lots of changing position of our data providers from, let's say, non-data sharing position to, to, to opening up and sharing lots of uh, 
uh, either real or, or synthetic data, you'll see what these synthetic data are. So, so we will also mention this aspect of the project. And finally, I'm going to go briefly over um, a subset of the use cases, uh, sort of from the technical perspective. And then uh, we will see in, in the following uh, uh, sessions by the data providers, the real impact in terms of, let's say, business KPIs that, that these use cases had on, on our data providers. So, so let's start from the Abita solution from the front end. So what you're seeing here is a, a standard, let's say conventional big data uh, pipeline. So going from left to right, uh, you have some users that have certain data, they need to analyze their data and um, visualize the results uh, so that they, they can get uh, uh, useful insights uh, from the big data analysis. Now I'm going to focus on on the, on the innovations and specificities that the, the IBIDA solution has, also reflecting the, 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 key, the key objectives of uh, self-service and breaking silos that, that Sotiris mentioned. So on the side of users, uh, we provide uh, a flexible solution that uh, um, has three different modes of operation that are uh, defined with respect to the actual knowledge that uh, the, the end users have with respect to big data analytics. So we have an expert mode where actually expert big data developers can develop and upload their own code based on the code templates that we offer. Then we have a self-service mode that is meant for data analysts who, uh, who can select a predefined algorithm that the Abidos platform offers based on the domain knowledge that uh, they have about the problem. And finally, we have a code develop mode, which is uh, uh, basically uh, meant for um, uh, industry in-house employees and, and, and is developed um, for a specific industrial use case with the help of IBDST. On the side of data, uh, we offer um, several capabilities. One of them is the realistic data fabrication, uh, thanks to a technology by IBM, where uh, basically we can um, fabricate data that uh, uh, resembles real data. And this helps, uh, for example, in early development stages when the real data is still in preparation or cannot be shared. Um, and this actually helped a lot in, in our project too. And also uh, helps in breaking silos when, when the real data cannot be um, used outside of, of premises of, of a data provider. On the side of analytics, we offer both batch and stream analytics uh, solutions. So we will see use cases um, today that are examples of both of these types of analysis. And on the side of analysis, we can visualize results and, and share models. Uh, we will be demonstrating this, uh, this uh, uh, solution through several industrial use cases, but also what we call generic experiments, which are the self-service and the, the expert models today. So we will see this later in much more detail. Uh, just uh, uh, to offer another perspective, um, uh, of, of the EBITDA solution, where basically I show here an ex a prototypical experimental workflow of EBITDA. So abstracting details, uh, we focus here on, on, on three key steps. So in the first step, users either fabricate or tokenize data. And then uh, thanks to this, they can um, offload their, their data to external premises. And, and this is very important because typically uh, the premise, uh, the, the infrastructure for analysis by, by, by an industry, uh, in industrial companies occupied for, for the operational, um, um, operational experiments. And so it's very important to be able to experiment and test, and test the solutions um, outside of, of local premises. And, and this allows several functionalities uh, like uh, selecting an algorithm, tuning parameters, et cetera, that you will see later in more detail. But once satisfied with the, the solution, with the experimentation, we can uh, deploy and run the solution in local premises. And actually this uh, type of workflow uh, can significantly help in, in making the big data solutions uh, more agile and more efficient. Um, and uh, of course, this is just one possibility. Of course, the solution can be also deployed in, at, at uh, uh, internal premises. But in this way, we can significantly improve the agility and efficiency of big data solutions. Now, moving forward um, to, uh, to the IBIDA solution from the back end. So this is sort of uh, a picture, a complex picture that is showing uh, uh, various types of technologies uh, that are integrating, integrated and that, that we put together 
to make all these functionalities that I mentioned before available to end users. So uh, it, it's a complex system that, uh, that we have uh, um, uh, developed and integrated. Uh, so uh, I will not go into details of how all things work, but I will mention what we have in there uh, in a step-by-step -step fashion. So on the side of uh, data, user interface and visualization, we have several technologies. This is the TDF technology by IBM that I mentioned before for fabricating realistic synthetic data. The software AG universal messaging tool that makes the data available to other components uh, and the AG's advanced visualization toolkit that uh, can make advanced visualizations of the data and the results. On the side of batch analytics, uh, we have several technologies uh, uh, also. We have the COMPS uh, tool by Barcelona Supercomputing Center, which is um, a programming model um, uh, that allows uh, to uh, do a sequential coding of, uh, of uh, big data uh, algorithms that are then possible to be executed on, on a distributed and parallel architecture. Then we have also Hecuba, which is a data management tool and Cubist, which is a data indexing tool. Uh, and, uh, and finally, the University of Novi Sad and some other partners are developing actually machine learning algorithm implementations in the comms programming model and making this available as, as open source uh, um, uh, software algorithms. On the side of streaming analytics, uh, we have the software AG's complex event processing uh, 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 engine called APAMA, and we have the fourth solution for GPU accelerated analytics. And finally, on the side of resource management and integration, uh, we have the Atos resource management tool, um, uh, a set of tools and the ITML integration services. Now, uh, uh, having, having presented uh, uh, the, the solution from the front end and from the back end, let me go over briefly over some uh, key features and in innovations that, uh, that the EBITDA uh, solution uh, offers. And also let me kind of jump directly to, to the impact that these innovations have, um, either on, 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 uh, as measured by our data providers or, or as measured by, let's say, uh, with respect to the relevant technology and the relevant uh, technological KPIs. So, uh, so, for, so let's go one by one. So for the data fabrication capabilities that I mentioned before, uh, uh, in, incorporating uh, realistic synthetic data fabrication in a big data platform has an impact, for example, for Kaisha that we reduce a time from three months to one to two weeks for a new proof of concept uh, uh, of big data technology. So significant reduction in time. So for, for the flexibility of the solution with the three modes, expert self-service and co-develop uh, as an effect uh, also significantly reduces time to analysis. So for one of the Kaisha Bank use cases, we have three to four less time to analysis, but also we have a more high quality result than what was available before the project. The, the COMPS uh, uh, sequential programming paradigm allows to a significant reduction um, in, in the coding effort. So for example, uh, the, the reduction is on the order of 40% of coding effort while using this technology. And we also uh, have a, um, a way, a methodology for high code reusability. So using code templates in the expert mode that actually allows to develop new machine learning models based only um, changing a few lines of code uh, in a template. Uh, further innovations are uh, synergy of complex event processing and GPU accelerated analytics for streaming data, which increases significantly the throughput compared with the CPU only implementations on the order of 30 to 60%. Uh, and further innovations are feedback from analytics to data fabrication, uh, which basically uh, improves significantly the actual technology, the actual way the realistic synthetic data is, is produced. We have also feedback from analytics to problem modeling, which corresponds to basically develop novel tools uh, such as QBIST and QVs, where feedback from users is collected to guide machine learning algorithms. And all of these innovations that I mentioned have been demonstrated on eight real industrial use cases um, that I will mention briefly, but you will hear uh, 
much more details in the, in, in the next uh, slots, next sessions. And uh, actually these use cases correspond to three different data providers, three different industries. Um, and uh, 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 several of our innovations have been um, promoted by the European Commission as excellent innovations. And, and, and we have also published five innovations at the BDVA Innovation Marketplace uh, that, uh, that was also um, uh, discussed earlier today by Nuria. So these are the five uh, innovations that, uh, that uh, uh, the European Commission promoted as excellent innovations. Um, so I will go briefly over them. So you can see here the innovations, uh, uh, the market readiness and the relevant uh, uh, partners of the project. So the first of them is actually uh, the specification of an end-to-end -end big data as a self-service platform. So the actual platform that I mentioned before, its specification uh, has been uh, promoted as an excellent innovation, the platform as a whole, let's say. Then uh, the advanced visualization toolkit by Aegis. So what you're seeing here is one of the type of types of dashboards that this tool offers. And this tool offers a set of visualization tools that allow for a more straightforward exploratory analysis using real-time data analytics, interactive and shareable um, and collaborative features uh, of visualizations. Then the next uh, uh, innovation is the uh, ADMM machine learning algorithm. So this is basically an integration of the COMPS programming model and ADMM, which is an optimization algorithm for distributed optimization that allows to solve different uh, industrial cases uh, based on code templates by tweaking only a few lines of code. Uh, the next innovation is the multi-dimensional storage with efficient sampling uh, by, by Cubist, and it allows uh, uh, for users to improve the initialization, convergence, scalability um, of algorithms, but also allows for interactive visualization. And the final um, innovation is uh, uh, within the TDF, the, uh, the data fabrication tool by IBM, where uh, a, a core technology of, of this tool is a constraint satisfaction solver. Now, in the context of the Abidus project, this solver has been uh, made parallel and uh, has uh, significantly improved so that now we can solve many uh, uh, CSP problems uh, in parallel. And actually, the performance of the tool has been improved by an order of magnitude. Uh, within the EBITDA's project. Uh, on the side of, uh, of scientific activities, uh, we have uh, developed several results. So on the left-hand side uh, of the slide, you can see uh, an overview of, uh, of the total numbers. Uh, let me just mention some highlights. So on the EBITDA's architecture specification and evaluation, we have published uh, some papers, four conference papers. On the side of batch analytics, we have also a number of papers, three journals, six conferences. We have also uh, published uh, scientific work on, on the analysis and aspects of data sharing and privacy risks that also Nuria highlighted as an important aspect. So we have three conference papers there. And also um, we are publishing two book chapters on lessons learned with respect to uh, big data analytics um in banking and manufacturing so so the, we we uh, we wrote two chapters that are uh, pending minor review but uh, uh, actually um, are very good uh, uh, tangible outcomes so on the lessons learned um, of implementing big data analytics in banking and manufacturing data sharing uh, aspects etc uh, so this slide here uh, summarizes uh, our activities in the project uh, with respect to breaking silos and data sharing that, uh, that, that Sotiris also mentioned is one of the important objectives. So we have carried out uh, lots of activities in the project uh, regarding uh, uh, sharing data. Uh, uh, we have uh, achieved, thanks to a uh, lots of background work by our data providers, to actually share several data sets. So you see some numbers here with respect to some data sets that have been shared. Um, and what, what I would also like to mention is that we actually organized events where data has been shared with external entities. For example, we organized the hackathon by CRF, 
which is our data provider in manufacturing, and by Telefonica, uh, which is our data provider in, in, in telecom, where actually external entities could play with the data and, and achieve results and also provide some benchmarks for us of, uh, of what can be accomplished with the given data sets. Uh, so this slide summarizes uh, the industrial use cases that uh, we have uh, we have developed and also the, the respective data sets. So you will hear much more about this in, in the next slots. Uh, I will focus uh, on uh, just briefly on uh, one use case per data provider, uh, mentioning um, uh, from the technical perspective what, uh, what we have achieved. And uh, uh, later on, you will, you will hear what, what kind of impact this had in terms of business KPIs on our data providers. So starting from, uh, from the banking, uh, so Kaisha Bank uh, uh, offered a use case that deals with finding relationships uh, between uh, users based on the IP addresses that they connect to. So the rationale is that the users that connect uh, from similar IP addresses are likely to be um, in a relationship. And it's important to, to, to see which users are in a, in a relationship because, um, uh, this, uh, because the transactions that happen between users that are not in a relationship may correspond to, let's say, something suspicious or fraudulent, et cetera. And so for this use case, we have developed a, a solution based on clustering methods that, uh, uh, that, that uh, take into account both batch and streaming analytics. Uh, you are seeing here also at the bottom part of the slide um, in, uh, an architecture uh, a picture how the Ibida solution specializes to this use case. So not going into details, let me just briefly mention that actually the left sort of left column, left part of the picture correspond to batch processing and uh, the right part correspond to streaming processing and the batch processing actually allows to, to learn the relationships between the users and then this information is fed to the stream processing part that, that actually can detect whether relationships happen between users that are not in a relationship uh, in real time. Uh, one example of the use case for, for the manufacturing uh, industry is production process of aluminum die casting. So, so here the context is that uh, uh, we are considering the aluminum casting process and the question is, can we classify the quality levels of engine blocks correctly at the time they are produced? So current processes uh, assume that, uh, that the engine blocks are classified um, uh, after, after the process is finished. So if we can speed this up, this, this can have a significant impact uh, on, on the production processing and significant savings. So we have developed a solution for this use case as well, where basically we can uh, classify early uh, the quality of uh, engine blocks production with a good accuracy of up to 73%. And we also devised an architecture for this solution that you can see, and we are not going to, to go into, into much details. And finally, uh, on the side of, uh, of telecom, uh, one example of the use cases uh, is the call centers, uh, where we, we are interested in quality of service in call centers. And the objective is to quickly get familiar and understand customer's perspective and main interest uh, to improve customer service by using big data speech and language analytics. So we have devised a solution for this as well, uh, based on GPU accelerated keywords matching, and we achieve uh, a high efficiency in terms of a process, in terms of the number of calls process where we can uh, uh, process on the order of 40,000 uh, calls per second. So let me just uh, uh, sort of give an outlook. Uh, so the project is finishing, but uh, we, we believe that, uh, that it leaves um, lots of uh, tangible outcomes and um, an impact for the future as well. So here you see some examples of this. So one example is that uh, uh, an open source variant of the IBIDA solution with a user guide uh, will become available. Uh, we, we are offering several open source scalable machine learning implementations uh, also. Uh, clearly, IBIDA is, is a research and innovation project. So, so we, do not, uh, we do not offer um, 
um, a product, let's say market ready with a, a super high TRL, but we, we have been thinking about how commercial variants of the platform uh, will look like. And you will see here uh, today later uh, more information about this. There has been a spin-off called QBIS launch uh, uh, in the context of the project. And uh, finally, our data providers uh, are taking uh, steps forward after the project end. Uh, so uh, uh, Kaisha Bank uh, uh, is devising a garage lab exper experimental platform. CRF uh, uh, is preparing an experimental training environment and Telefonica is going to uh, release internal innovation calls uh, related to the results of the EBS project. Uh, that would be all from uh, my side. Thank you very much for attention. Thank you, Dusan. Thank you for your great uh, presentation. Um, let's continue with uh, the next slot. Uh, it's time to go to the uh, data providers. Uh, so the IBITES application of the financial sector from uh, Dr. Ramon Martin de Pozuelo. Uh, Ramon is a project manager at Security Innovation and Transformation in Caixa Bank. He received his PhD in ICT and its management by La Salle School of Engineering from Universitat Ramon de Lul. In Barcelona. In 2018, he joined Kaisa Bank as a project manager for technical fraud prevention and security innovation and transformation, in which he has been managing the participation of Kaisa Bank in several H2020 projects. He is a certified fraud examiner since 2018. As a member of the IBITAS, Ramon is working on the financial pilot. So after Ramon, we will have the break uh, 25 minutes and then we will break. Thank you, Ramon. The floor is yours. Okay, thank you. Um, so, uh, so I will I will explain um, uh, how we have used um, IBDAS in the banking sector. Um, as uh, Despina has said, I'm part of the digital security department. I'm part of the team on, on security innovation and transformation. So, um, it could be several applications uh, actually on the on the banking sector, but we have focused on the fraud prevention as is one of, of my roles there okay um so oh sorry okay yeah so um, um first of all to explain a little bit more about about Kashabang and the usage of of the data in in Kashabang Kashabang is uh, one of the of the leading financial groups in in Spain actually with the recent merging uh, that will be um, completed in, in February, next February, uh, with, with Bankia, we will be the leader uh, in, in terms of, of a number of customers that right now we are uh, more than uh, 40 million customers, but we will be um, 21 million. Uh, we have um, 7 million um, users online, um, active users. Um, we have uh, more than uh, 30,000 uh, employees, um, 9000 uh, atms and all these all these uh, channels uh, of information with our clients we are collecting information okay um we are collecting information um especially for fraud prevention and cybersecurity and uh, that's why we we are here um uh, we are here collaborating in ibidas actually um we built uh, the, the the big data department in 2014, um, but now right now um, collecting all this information internally and externally, um, we have more than four uh, petabytes of information in our only in our big data, and more than hundreds of people uh, working on data analytics uh, services in our organization. Okay, but we have several uh, regulation constraints. Uh, and that's one of the problems that we have and one of the, of the challenges that we, that we had when we started Ibidas, because why do we need Ibidas? Um, we, we have these tons of, of data, um, uh, but all of this data is confidential. Actually, we are not the real owners of the data, but we, are the, the, uh, we, we, we keep this data from our customers. Uh, some of the, of the data um, is, is ours because it's internal. Uh, information, but we have several information that uh, are information from our customers. So, um, um, how we can use this uh, information uh, within the regulation, especially with with uh, GDPR 
or uh, we are we are a very uh, highly regulated sector, uh, the banking sector, um, and um, apart from these uh, privacy concerns, um, we are very tight with our regulator. Our regulator is our, is always uh, controlling and overwatching us uh, all all the services that we are offering. That we are always compliance with um, with uh, security and privacy regulations. Um, that's on the one hand, and on the other hand, we have a huge infrastructure with all this data that uh, we have to have it internally because of these regulations um but but for if for that that um that misses some that we have a lack of agility on on this huge infrastructure if we want to have a new tool uh for doing this big data analytics on this data um we have to spend uh, a lot of time uh, on these security procedures and constraints for for um um, having this new tool uh, inside Cashabank. And if we have something that we, uh, a solution that can help us to do this self service uh, big data analytics on the cloud outside our premises, that will help a lot uh, our, our day to day um, big data analytics. So we want to divide us for, for um, doing this evaluation of a, uh, an external platform that help us to gain agility, efficiency, and flexibility in our big data analytics. And uh, we will focus on this uh, security and fraud prevention um, use cases. Okay. So uh, as I said, um, what we wanted is to break um, external um, and, and also internal silos that we have, okay? But especially external, how we can share data um, and, and upload this data uh, with um, with uh, the regulation that we have on on the privacy of our clients. Um, uh, how can we uh, be more agile on doing those things and also um, to um, have uh, incorporate new solutions and new knowledge in a more agile way? Okay, uh, but also with the uh, control of our of those regulations that uh, we have on regulators like. Um, the ECB and the Banco de España, okay, the Central European Bank. Um, so that on the one side, on the one hand, on the other hand, we want a self service infrastructure that can help us. Um, not only the big data analysts that are um, that are uh, those people are specialized and with this IT knowledge that can uh, well uh, process this data that we have. But also uh, on the um, on the um, normal employees would say uh, uh, that has all the knowledge about the data, but the, they doesn't have they don't have these um, skills, special skills on data analysts. So we want to help them on providing this self service solution for them. Okay, um, and uh, why we why we have to do this? Uh, one of the of the other um, factors that are, are um, making us hurry on this on this uh, type of solutions is that uh, we ha we are a very competitive sector, and we have new actors in the sector that uh, all, all those uh, fintechs and big techs that want to enter in the financial sector, and uh, well, those those are very um, very IT. Uh, focused um, uh, enterprises, and we have to be as competitive in that um, IT sector as they are. Okay, so we have to be uh, competitive and, and agile on, on on adopting these innovations, and also be more efficient uh, on doing those things because we have this huge amount of data, but we have to automate the process of analyzing this data. Um, they said how we are doing it right now. We are, we are, uh, we have all the data cycle uh, inside of Cashabank, all the data cycle of of all doing all the process of big data in our, yeah, in our infrastructure. But um, well, we we do the, the data analysis, the data exploration, um, the data storage in our data pool. Everything is inside of Cashabank because of these regulations. But what if we can do part of this? Uh, data analysis lifecycle um, outside. Okay, uh, so if we have this IBDAS platform outside, 
we can have the access to this um, IBDAS platform by external people um, that will help us to uh, have the knowledge of external people without those um, security uh, constraints and security procedures that are very long. Uh, and well, that will help us to, to be more agile. Also, also on adopting new tools as I bid us. So um, how we can do all this process with parts of this um, lifecycle outside our premises. How would you do that? On the one hand, we have this, as, as um, Dusan has said, we have this data generation tool inside IBIDAS that can help us to uh, generate uh, synthetic data uh, that uh, can be accessible by external people. And on the other hand, we have defined um, different tokenized, uh, well, tokenizing uh, algorithms that can um, help to uh, anonymize this data uh, if it's outside our premises. Okay. At the end, we will have this um, sole service uh, data analytic um, solution that uh, we can extract the results from, from this, uh, this solution. And again, um, insert those inside of our premises to enrich our data. So as I, as I said, we had in mind at the beginning of uh, just using synthetic data. We didn't want to use uh, this uh, approach of tokenized data. We just wanted to evaluate the usage of synthetic data because it's um, um, more uh, secure actually, um, um, but because at the end, it's not any uh, real data at all in this data. So uh, we will not have for sure any, any data breach. Um, but um, but at some point we realized that it would be it wouldn't be enough with that uh, because it, as I will explain later it, it has some pros and cons to use this synthetic data and uh, we wanted to evaluate also the use cases with real data and um, at some point in the project we changed our mind and we did the rest of the use cases with uh, all with uh, real tokenized data. So this is uh, the three use cases that we uh, that we did in IBIDAS. Okay. Um, uh, on the one hand, we have this um, analysis uh, of uh, relationship through IP addresses. Um, this is the one that we did uh, with synthetic data and real tokenized data. Um, first, we did it uh, with synth with synthetic data, and we uh, what we wanted to do is to validate the use of this synthetic data. For, for our analysis. And uh, if the rules act in the same way uh, as, we, uh, as we do with the real data. So we did this comparison with uh, synthetic and tokenized uh, real data. Um, what we wanted here is, well, I will, I will explain a little bit later on. Um, on the second and the third use case, we use only a real data. And what we tried is to uh, um, extract some anomalies on these uh, different scenarios of bank transfers, um, on doing bank transfers from the bank offices and also uh, on the online banking. And uh, well, to evaluate uh, how IBDAS can help us to um, speed up the analysis of these, of these use cases. The first use case, as I said, we wanted to, analyze, uh, to do this analysis of relationships to IP addresses. What does it mean? Uh, it means that uh, we, have, we are collecting uh, the information uh, internally of the people that are connecting to online banking. Um, and we are analyzing if they are connecting from, um, from uh, the same IP address. Um, why we are doing it? It's because of, of, as I said, for fraud prevention, okay? Um, and how that can be applied for, for fraud prevention um, is we are, we are analyzing if two people know each other very well. And uh, apart from the information that we have uh, from the customers, um, we have this information that are collecting from them that can, some, can hint uh, some, uh, can, do, can give us some hints about if they are knowing each other or not, okay? And um, so 
we do this, we do this, we apply this algorithm for finding relationships between people that, that live together, okay, or that has uh, um, uh, geographic, uh, well, they, the, the residents are the same, okay. Um, we apply that way and we see that, for example, for this, um, well, I will, I will switch to um, the live demo, okay, and, and I will go to the, this develop mode as I as Jason has explained and we have these two fold um, um, use cases of the analysis of the relationship through IP addresses I will go to the batch processing in the batch processing what we are doing is uh, we can do with the fabricated or with tokenized okay um, I will go for one of the um, experiments that I already created okay um, this is the this is the pre-configured um, use case in which you can um, just select uh, the data set that you want to, to test, okay? And if you proceed, you will see that we have here in this data set um, around um, 5,000 people that has one connection to another to another uh, client of this data set. And uh, around 1,000 people that has two connections with uh, two other clients of the data set, okay? This is a, a very um, a brief uh, graphic of it. Uh, the important thing will be if you can download this file. I already downloaded this file and you can have here, for example, all the different clients IDs, okay? This, I, this client has a relation with this, uh, with this other client and uh, as well with this other client. So if this client has two relations it found on this data set. But I haven't said why we, why, how we are using it, okay, or why is it important? Because, for example, I show here in the video the, the other part, the part of the stream processing, in which we are um, receiving the bank transfers of, uh, I run the experiment and we are receiving bank transfers uh, that are processing at that time. And um, we found that we have um, uh, one relationship with, the, with the, this bank transfer in which uh, we have uh, we have found that uh, from the from the uh, previous relationship that we have found in the batch processing, okay, we found uh, in this bank transfer that uh, this uh, the sender and the receiver uh, know each other, okay. So if the sender and the receiver know each other, okay, um, we we can um, we know that that uh, these two people are uh, uh, live together and. Uh, normally, and it's something that we normally apply, um, uh, it is a secure bank transfer, okay? So we don't have to double check uh, with the security operations center if uh, this bank transfer uh, is a potentially fraudulent bank transfer or we have to apply um, additionally uh, authentication mechanisms. So as I said, we can um, download this file Okay, and we can have, uh, apart from uh, seeing it uh, uh, in a very um, brief graphic, uh, we can download this file and apply this file uh, in, the, in our internal system, in the Security Operating Center, in order to um, identify those ones that are secure band transfers and don't have to apply additionally, um, additionally uh, mechanisms for authentication on, the, on these bank transfers. To be applied, um, you can select as well a user, and you can see the graph uh, of relationships of the user, for example. Okay. So this is another functionality that we add on this use case. And as I said, we did it with the synthetic data and with real data. And here are some of the um, some of the um, conclusions on using synthetic data. Um, it helped us to streamline the process of of uh, accessing the data without um, going all the procedures of uh, the digital security department of my colleagues uh, for accessing this uh, sensitive data. And it also helped us to uh, streamline the process of establishing a new proof of concept, because as I said, um, we can do this um, um, and um, we, we can do this evaluation of uh, big data analytic tools without integrating completely in our system that will take very, very long process of uh, almost six months. So on the second use case, what we did is to analyze the bank transfers executed from our employees 
in the uh, financial terminal, that this is the terminal that they have in the offices, in name of, in name of a customer. So when, when a customer goes to the bank office and order uh, a bank transfer and our employee execute it. Okay, so um, what we what we wanted here is to uh, find ways to do it with real data. So we did uh, we tokenize the data. Um, by tokenize, I I I, uh, I meant um, we encrypt the data and we keep the keys of this encryption inside uh, in a safe place inside a cash bank, and we. Um, export this, uh, this uh, encrypted data. And we did the analysis over the encrypted data. Okay. Um, so what we did is to um, collect all the information from uh, the bank transfer that refers not only uh, to the customer, but also to the receiver of the bank transfer, to the employee, to the bank office in which is made, uh, whatever contextual information that could be interesting for finding any anomaly. Okay, uh, we, encrypt, we encrypted all this information and we did, we export this information uh, to IBIDAS and we did the, uh, the, analyst, the analysis in IBIDAS. I switch again to, uh, the, to um, the IBIDAS platform. Okay, so I go to the expert mode and we have here in the expert mode, this, um, this solution, okay, this use case. And again, well, this is a pre-configured um, expert more for uh, doing this uh, use case. And I have some experiments already here that I will uh, open it for, for uh, spinning it up. Okay. And um, if we proceed with this, we, have, we can download the file with information of the analysis, but we have a special visualizer for uh, this uh, type of, uh, of uh, use case in which I have here already um, uh, I load already did, and um, and here we have this visualizer in which I have all the information from the bank transfers that uh, have been applied with this 3D uh, spot uh, graph. Okay, and um, here we can uh, the, the the user, the employee of Casa Bank that is analyzing if there is any anomaly on of, of this bank transfer can visually. Uh, identify any cluster of uh, any small cluster that can be identified as an anomaly, okay, or some a set of anomalies, and um, we can select it. I already did it. I select this uh, this amount of um, bank transfers, and these are the ones that you can see here. Okay, so um, doing it, it's very simple for uh, the for the employee to upload a new data set to analyze this data set to visualize it to select those anomalies and uh, those anomalies appear here okay those are encrypted okay as you can say here as you can see here okay this is uh, we apply different encryptions and um, and the text is doing a, a bloom filter so you find here like a um, set of numbers but this is the text that you can compare. Um, you have here also some information that is not sensitive and can be clear, or um, also the amount of the of the bank transfer is a huge amount of information for each bank transfer, and um, those are the ones that are identified as anomalies. So you can um, download these anomalies, and uh, the security operator center can analyze why IBIDAS has um, identified this uh, this uh, cluster as an anomaly, okay? Um, we did as well on comparison with uh, another tool that we have for doing this kind of things in, in, in Gashabank for providing this so, kind of self-service solution um, that is called Data Robot. It's a commercial product that uh, we use. Um, but we if we do, Similar things on Data Robot, we find that the the um, hotspot cloud that can that uh, can be made with uh, with Data Robot, um, it's more difficult to visually identify those um, those anomalies. And uh, we can also select those anomalies, and we uh, identify that there are well uh, different uh, set of anomalies identified with Data Robot and with IBIDAS. Uh, depending on different features, okay? So this is complementary, okay? Um, but on um, 
on the um, bright side is that uh, we saw that in IBIDAS, um, we can provide a more flexible uh, solution in defining your code, your scoring metrics that uh, in DataRobot you cannot, um, because it, that was done uh, with the expert mode and so you can tweak um, um, the code and, and, and be uh, more uh, personalized. And on the other on the other side, um, we have as well that um, in the unsupervised learning, IB has provided a much more detailed uh, results that uh, Data Robot provided. Okay. Um, I'm sorry. And on the third on the third use case before going to the um, before going to the conclusions, I will show you as well um, similar uh, to uh, this uh, expert mode uh, use case that we had. Uh, the online banking. The online banking, what we wanted is to do a similar thing, but analyzing uh, the, the a data set that is providing the, date, the bank transfers between uh, customers that are done in mobile to mobile bank transfer. Okay, so you, you go again to the borderline visualizer, that is this advanced visualizer. But in this case, um, it provides, um, apart from the visualization, and you can also download um, those um, data sets that you, the sub data sets that you can select. You can select everything and it has a clustering feature. Okay, this clustering feature allows us to you to, to say, to define the number of clusters you want to apply to this, um, this data. And I run, I already run it for speeding up the presentation uh, with two to eight, uh, uh, clusters, and you can find here the results uh, on these two to eight, to eight uh, clusters. What we wanted to do here is not only to find uh, the anomalies, but also to identify uh, which is the um, best um, way to, cl to clusterize the data that we are receiving in order to apply um, different authentication mechanisms for these specific bank transfers. Okay, or identify as well if there are a set of, of uh, bank transfers in which we are not applying the right authentication mechanisms because we identify that they are very similar to another uh, cluster in which we are applying higher uh, authentication mechanisms. Okay, and in order to finalize the presentation, I will summarize um, uh, the lessons learned and the benefits that we had. Okay, um, on the one hand, um, IB does allow us to uh, break these information silos, um, giving access and, and a more uh, an easier access to external people to uh, to do big data analytics on our data, okay? Uh, but being secure uh, in different ways with the synthetic and with the tokenized data that we have analyzed. Um, so uh, if we only analyze the synthetic data. Um, we can streamline this access to the data to new providers for the first analysis and to improve performance on the evaluation and integration of new tools by speeding up this, the process of, of analyzing external tools. Um, but if we analyze all together with the tokenized data um, uh, approach, we realize that we have established a way uh, for extracting uh, and analyzing the sensitive data outside our premises uh, that helps us to test new solutions, not only in the, uh, at the performance level, uh, but also at the accuracy level of those solutions. Uh, so as I said, um, we uh, made the main benefit that we got is to increase in the efficiency and the competitiveness in management, uh, this uh, huge amount of data. Uh, how we have this time reduction on accessing uh, data uh, from external stakeholders. Um, if we can, if we use synthetic data, all the process uh, can be uh, reduced to uh, one, uh, one and a half day to, to uh, generate the data as maximum. Um, and on the other hand, to, we, we gave access to uh, several different external entities, skipping this long time data access procedures that we have in the digital security department. Um, and being secure enough. Um, and we, uh, we evaluated uh, the Vida solution with uh, all those different features that I uh, showed to you and help us to our internal 
employees to analyze the data uh, with these uh, three different real use cases. Okay, um, we did a workshop in in the summer in which we uh, received the feed, the very positive feedback of uh, several data analysts internal uh, of Cashabank and also external of Cashabank, and uh, they are willing to have uh, um, more uh, access to this uh, to this tool to continue uh, evaluating this this approach. That's all from my side. Thank you, Ramon, for your great presentation. It is time to move on to our ne next presentation and the IBDAS application to the telecommunication sector uh, from Dr. Ioannis Arapakis. Uh, Ioannis is a researcher at uh, Telefonica Research in Barcelona. Uh, prior to joining Telefonica, he was uh, a research scientist at uh, Yahoo Labs. He received uh, his PhD in information retrieval from the School of Computing Science uh, of the University of Glasgow. Uh, his uh, research interests include data mining, information retrieval, and human computer interaction. As a member of IBDAS, Ioannis is working on the telecommunication pilot. Ioannis, the floor is yours. The floor is mine to swipe the carpet of your feet. Hi, everybody. Um, give me a second to uh, figure out how to share the screen. Okay. Uh, maybe not the screen, but just the presentation. Mm. Well, actually, maybe I should share the whole screen. I think it's, the screen in order yeah. to switch for the light. Yeah. Uh, but, uh, okay, I'm going to do it one more time. There is an option for uh, optimizing the screen share. Okay. Perfect. Okay, so you should be able to see what I see, right? I see the, yeah, yeah. Okay, cool. Mm, so thank you, Despina, for this. Uh, uh, yes? The, the quality is not that good. Let's check if... Uh, it might be because I'm connected to the VPN in order to show the, um, the call mm. center demo. So uh, I don't know. Is it, is it still? Is it still bad? Yeah. Okay, then I guess. Um, Perhaps I, you can. Uh, uh, the not victimize option. Try to uh, mm, to do okay. it without. To check if it is good. It's better. Okay, just one second. Uh, okay, screen share without optimizing anything. It's funny if you optimize. Yeah, it's better. much better. Okay. Okay. I, I guess maybe if it's optimized for video, it re down samples the, the quality of the Probably, yeah. Okay. Good to go then. You guys can see me? Yes, we can and see. And you can see my slides, right? Mm -hmm, yep. Okay. So uh, thank, thank this enough for the. Uh, introduction. Um, so I, I will be discussing, uh, presenting the role of um, uh, Telefonica Research uh, in this quite challenging project, uh, EBDAS, that uh, Desmina and uh, Sotiris and everybody else have, um, have uh, presented so far. And uh, I will give you an overview of uh, our role and the three use cases that we, we are leading in this project and um, highlight some of the you know, challenges we, we managed to tackle and, and pre discuss briefly what we have achieved. So um, before I start, I'll give you an overview of, uh, of Telefonica in case you know, some of you are not familiar with Telefonica. Uh, Telefonica is one of the largest telecommunication companies in the world. Uh, by market capitalization and, uh, and number of customers. Uh, we provide over world-class fixed mobile and uh, broadband, broadband networks. We operate in uh, 16 countries uh, that are split into geographic regions, uh, Europe and Latin America. Uh, we have more than 350 million customers, uh, including 270 million mobile customers. 
and nearly 13 million fiber and cable customers and more than 8 million pay TV customers. So you understand we have uh, quite a large user base, a lot of, uh, a big, big volume, massive volume of data is produced daily. And this is, I guess, uh, one of the main reasons why we are a uh, use case and a uh, use case partner. Um, so, you know, considering this massive volume of users, our user interact with various services that we provide and these services trigger the production of uh, diverse types of data at different levels of our network infrastructure. That is, uh, some data are produced at user level with end user devices like smartphones and laptops and include uh, data regarding uh, web activities, web browsing, for example, uh, TV viewing, radio streaming, video calling, and so on. Whereas other data are produced at the network uh, infrastructure uh, by routers and antennas as a reaction to this uh, user activity in the network, such as phone calls, SMSing, um, roaming, traveling in the city, and so on. Uh, both types of data are very useful for modeling user behavior, and they can be utilized by the telco that owns them or by other telcos and uh, third-party companies. Now, having said that, sharing uh, data across companies uh, or, or insights, you know, based that are based on user information and, and activities, uh, very strictly regulated nowadays. It is uh, very difficult to achieve, and that, of course, uh, diminishes the utility of the data and the insights. Uh, so mm, it's not easy to share it, uh, and it's not easy to audit and monitor, especially when it needs to be be done at the user level, or at least with the user's consent. So with this uh, strict uh, EU regulations like the GDPR and e-privacy, um, we needed different methods to uh, detect and stop such activities, you know, that um, are threatening user cyber privacy. And uh, these challenges are becoming even more difficult to address when data are combined from different sources within a company or they are to be taken to the extreme case combined across companies as we try to do in, uh, in the context of Fibidas on this. Uh, in this, uh, this project. Um, so in order to utilize uh, this diverse data uh, in a secure and privacy preserving uh, and industry supported manner, um, we had to come up with innovative technologies such as the ones we envision in, uh, in EBITAS. And with EBITAS, TID's vision was to use uh, many big data technologies, both buzz and streaming, in a unified platform and solve some of the major challenges that we're dealing with these days. Um, to this end, uh, EBITDAS, uh, we felt that it could support a telecom company like Telefonica by designing and implementing um, a complete framework of tools that augments real data, um, real data platforms with the functionality needed to enable um, new, highly diverse and synergistic data ecosystem in a privacy preserving manner and also leverage advanced visualization techniques and approaches and dashboards, intelligence dashboards that harness the power of uh, multiple heterogeneous data sources uh, and big data analytics. And um, this basically facilitates the, the, the ability to take the data, uh, understand it, uh, process it, digest it, extract value from it, visualize it, communicate it, um, and then with the primary um, focus to empower both the expert as well as the non-expert uh, big data practitioners. And within this, uh, this effort, we are uh, leading three uh, use cases. As you can see, the first is about the quality of service in call centers. And this basically use case, uh, as I will explain later on, uh, is about um, optimizing uh, how call centers uh, the, the call center operations. Uh, we have another use case uh, that's about understanding how people move around uh, an urban environment. That's the accurate location prediction with high traffic and visibility. And finally, we have one use case that's very uh, super important actually, uh, the optimization of placement of telecommunication equipment. And this is about understanding um, how our hardware uh, equipment um, performs in, an, in, in our network infrastructure and, and allows us to support strategic decision making as to how to um, place differently the equipment or acquire new equipment to compensate for, you know, areas with um, insufficient coverage or insufficient um, 
uh, sir, uh, where this, the services fail often and repeatedly. So to begin with, uh, the quality of service. So uh, some of the, the requirements addressed here, okay, we, we need to understand the nature of phone calls. So when um, customers call the call center, they usually call to report a problem, not to, to congratulate us for what a great service we provide. So we need to get quickly familiar and understand the customer's perspective, um, respond fast, and, and, and utilize this big data analytics and language analytics. So we want to uh, shorten the call duration, the, shorten the waiting time, and, 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 and the first call resolution time by uh, anticipating the, ca the customer situation. And, and we try to do that by um, develop, by working on a task that uh, allows us to predict the customer satisfaction. So we want to, we want to predict if the customer was satisfied by uh, the way we resolve a problem, by the way we address it, and so on. To do so, we used a very large anonymized data set uh, internally with 1.3 million transactions, which we've been uh, using also for, for uh, similar analysis, Telefonica. We analyzed va various acoustic features um, and, and spoken interactions and tried to predict the customer report satisfaction. And um, we also investigated whether these speech prosodic features can deliver uh, also complementary information to speech, uh, speech transcription. So to, to, to put it in layman's terms, <clears throat> um, again, in an un anonymized and privacy preserving manner, we try to understand um, what are the main problems reported in these calls by analyzing the transcript, uh, but at the same time, uh, how these uh, problems were expressed. So the, the, the voice of the, of the person calling is as important as what the, that person is saying, that person is communicating, and maybe sometimes even more important. Um, and how did we do that? Well, we explored the possibility of using uh, deep neural architectures. Uh, we performed uh, feature fusion uh, by using both um, uh, NLP features, linguistic features, as well as, as, well as prosodic features. That is uh, characteristics or features that have to do with um, the, the way people speak, uh, communicate, and so on, the, uh, how they voice the, their concerns. And this is, I think, the most important slide about this uh, course, uh, about this use case. It summarizes basically what we achieved in one slide in this table. To put it simply, currently there is no automated solution. So the customer audio calls are processed by human agents. And um, the business units are able to inspect less than 1% of the total calls per year. That's very costly and time consuming. Um, in, in, in simple math, a human agent working a 40 hour schedule per week can analyze about 11,520 calls per year. And that's an estimate, a rough estimate. This manual process by one human agent allows us to identify about 2,300 low customer satisfaction calls. So these are calls that are very important and we need to address them because they are the ones that have been identified as very problematic. With our solution, and by using just a single GPU, we are able to process 3.5 billion calls per year. That's, uh, that's a throughput of 40,000 transcripts per second. And we increase the number of the detected low customer satisfaction calls that, you know, the, those that are very urgent to 7,000, that's a 200% uh, increase. Uh, so you can see this is like a, 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 huge, a huge improvement in how we, we operate uh, the call centers. So um, yeah, I guess this slide has been uh, covered. And I would like to uh, give you a quick tour of the, of the dashboard that we have developed. Uh, maybe, let's see. Can you see, can you see my screen? I guess you should be. Yes. Okay. So <clears throat> what do we see here? We have uh, basically four components. You, you now see the top left. Uh, maybe I can minimize this. Okay, I got um, To the left side, you see the map of Spain. Um, we see the, uh, three, the locations of three core centers. 
So someone who's not a, an expert can quickly identify, okay, we have three call centers um, located, let's say, in Barcelona, Madrid, and Sevilla. And uh, right away, we can identify the, the, the positive calls, the calls with a positive outcome, and the percentage of the calls with a negative outcome. Uh, we can see, you know, that's more or less uh, on average in, uh, at this point, how these call centers um, are, uh, are, are working, the, the, the level of effectiveness. Um, so th this geographic representation allows one to quickly identify if a call center has, is dealing with a, uh, an issue, if a particular network has, uh, is dealing with problems. Uh, and it's a very quick overview. To the right hand side, uh, we see uh, per, per call center, here we see, for example, for Sevilla, the, the top uh, 10 keywords uh, um, uh, determined by the frequency of the appearing the transcripts um, that are mentioned. And this uh, is a way also to understand the nature of the problem. So imagine if, uh, I don't know, due to bad weather, the, we have very bad reception or the network is down. From here, we can quickly you know, understand, get a feeling of what are um, the problems or the keywords mentioned more often uh, during the, uh, the calls. Now, if we scroll below, uh, we have another representation. We go from the uh, spatial dimension to the temporal dimension. And we see uh, on the left-hand side um, a time window, which is a, uh, a refreshed every minute. And on the right-hand side, a window, which is refreshed uh, every hour. And this shows basically the percentage of positive calls and the hourly positive average. So um, here we want to see, okay, over time, how it's a uh, call center is doing. Uh, uh, so not only, you know, get a feeling of what is the percentage of problematic cases uh, that we are dealing with, but how is this progressing over time? Are we making progress? Are this reduced? Are, are, are we still, you know, it's a um, uh, ongoing problem. So, you know, where should we intervene and so on? Or at what point this was resolved? So this is a very, you know, uh, minimalistic layout, and I really like it because it focuses on the important and uh, main elements that one, uh, uh, let's say, uh, call center uh, manager should be concerned about. Uh, how well the call center is doing, what are the main problems addressed or uh, mentioned, and how, how are we dealing over time with these problems? How, what's our performance over time? Okay, I will switch now back to the presentation and take you to the next uh, use case. This is uh, about, uh, as I said, uh, predicting uh, uh, how move people move around in, a, in an urban environment. And um, here, like I said, you know, we want to predict those places that um, of high traffic of congestion and high traffic so you know uh, there are many people aggregated in a small area uh and that that uh, you know it's it's problematic that means that a lot of people have to be um connected to the same antenna cell sites and and that causes an overload of the of the cell sites and there are many challenges uh, that stem from this use, use case uh we want to uh, first of all, um, deal with missing events. So we have a sequence of events, a sequence of locations that people appear in the city, and maybe in some cases we have missing data. Um, we want to minimize the processing time, uh, how we're going to process these sequences uh, of data, this time, time series, uh, because they only grow in size over time, and also maintain uh, real-time delivery of the results. Our data set uh, consists of synthesized traces that mimic cellular network operations. And as I said, it uh, traces a time series of mobile events that contain some kind of encrypted uh, user information, a timestamp, and so on. And, and such events can be, you know, when somebody um, connects or disconnects from the network, makes a call, um, receives or sends an SMS, um, moves from one location area to the other, uh, changes radio technology, let's say switch from 3G to 4G and so on. And here we want to predict the movement from one sector to the other and estimate the delta, that's the percentage uh, of connected users per sector per hour in advance. And 
and you know, for this forecasting model, we can account for many things, um, uh, such as besides network data like um, the weather or or traffic or things that you know can affect how people move around in a city. Um, in our in our in EBITAS, what we we did, uh, Novice University did an excellent job at um, developing a model that. Um, uh, parallelizes operation and and and, and uh, every CPU core is assigned a process and 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 tests a different model, a time series model. Um, we we did um, the modeling uh, evaluation was done using 120,000 time series. Uh, it took only three hours on on a dedicated server. Um, we tried 100 different models, and we came up with uh, with a single one that had the best. Uh, 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 main performance metric, the average mean absolute error. And uh, now I think I'll switch again to the to the intelligent dashboard. So um, that might be a bit. Maybe I can hide it. Okay. Um, so what do you see here? You see here the map of Spain again. Um, and uh, here, you know, we, we use OpenStreetMaps. So this means that this intelligent dashboard can be augmented. Uh, we can incorporate different kind of um, API, map API, maps APIs, and show different kinds of information. Here we see Madrid and all the antennas are around in Toledo and so on. All, and all the, the antennas are around the, in the um, urban metropolitan area of Madrid. Um, we have uh, five classes uh, of symbols, five categories. The, the gray antennas are those with uh, the expected mean uh, number of connected users. So for, for these gray cases, we have on more or less the expected number of users connected. Now, you see there are some blue, dark blue and light blue uh, icons as well. Those are um, uh, those cases of antennas with uh, less than the average expected number of users connected. So they have fewer users connected than what we would normally anticipate. And that, that means that they are 0.5 for the mean average uh, expected users or 0.25. That's one, one quarter of the expected uh, users. And those with orange and, and red are those cases with more users than we normally expect them to connect. So you, you see these are the under, uh, uh, problematic cases. So people means that there is massive movement from you know, light gray or light blue areas to red areas, to red antennas. And here we have some uh, functionality, nice buttons where we can uh, highlight those that are um, underutilized or those that are overutilized or show the mole uh, as well as modify the opacity and so and so on. And uh, here we also have, um, we can replay uh, historical data um, and see, you know, uh, during the, the course of uh, a day or so, what is happening, like uh, how people move around and, and so on. Um, okay, I think. I'll switch now back to the presentation. And then uh, finally, for the last uh, use case, um, I'd say that's my favorite one. Uh, we want to, in this use case, support uh, large scale uh, cellular networks, um, they, they how they operate. And the mobile network operators you know, need to constantly monitor the network performance. And it's a non-trivial task. So we came up with something called hotspot. And, and a hotspot basically is a, an antenna, a cell site that is going to become um, um, overutilized. It's going to be uh, underperformed because there way, will be way too many users connected to it because of you know high traffic congestion and so on. And th this is very difficult to anticipate um, because it's affected by both regular and non-regular events, uh, triggered by human behavior as well as hardware failures. And while our network operators have a good understanding of the performance of the network and you know forecasting the performance of its sector it's not something trivial um, so we came up with um, uh, a solution initially that's based on uh, heuristics and uh, rule-based models but this requires domain expertise and periodic updates 
because these rules apply, you know, when you have a normality, but when you have a pandemic, uh, things change a lot, and then you have to reconsider uh, how uh, uh, what you should consider a hotspot or not, and what are the parameters that affect it or determine it. So there are dynamics at play that, uh, you know, we, we cannot anticipate, or it's costly to anticipate them uh, and redefine them periodically. So here what we do, we uh, use the synthetic data set of about a million um, uh, examples uh, with uh, 16 uh, features and, and ground truth, of course. That includes more than 40,000 cell sites. It's a 24 hour cycle. And uh, we did predictive modeling. We tried different neural net architectures and we tried to anticipate whether at a certain day an antenna will become a hotspot or not. Uh, and here you see a summary of the results. We tried uh, several models, among the most per best performing is a random forest, an XT boost, and a cat boost, all well, variations of decision trees, basically. Um, and you can see the uh, results they achieve are quite impressive. And I will show you also the demo for that. Uh, Now here you see a very similar uh, view, but uh, you know don't be don't be fooled. It's not the same. Uh, it's not the same because here, um, although again we see the same map of Spain, uh, our our antennas are categorized into two types: a hotspot or a regular usage. Uh, it, this is a real time feed, means that we we don't have a re, uh, uh, we don't replay historical data. And um, of course, the first thing you notice is, OK, but where are the hotspots? Well, the hotspots amount to a realistic, uh, you know, uh, uh, talking about a, re a realistic estimation would be uh, 3 or 4% of our antennas would become hotspots within a day. So here we kind of exaggerate a bit and show a few more hotspots just to make it more obvious, more apparent. And again, we have uh, functionalities like show only the hotspots uh, or hide them. Uh, also all antennas, uh, we can change the opacity. And of course, I can even click on an antenna and get longitude to latitude and the antenna, let's say, ID. Uh, of course, these are synthesized data, not realistic. Um, and, uh, you know, we can also see, besides the live view, what happened one or two hours or three hours or four hours before uh, to study what happened in the recent past or go to live view. Okay, and um, finally, I would like to conclude with uh, uh, an event that we planned some time ago and uh, we weren't sure <laughs> how and when it's going to materialize to take place. And it, I'm talking about the Telefonica Research Hackathon. So because of uh, the COVID, we decided to go with an online hackathon. Um, it took place uh, in October and we did this uh, with, in collaboration with uh, Weira who supported us also with the prize and, 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 and with the organization. Um, the hackathon was about, uh, again, the quality of service in call centers. That was the theme uh, that is, you know, try to predict the customer satisfaction. Uh, um, it was the, the main challenge. And we had students and PhDs and researchers, employees from startups and SMEs from all over Europe um, that participated, team up to address the challenge. And we have in total eight participating teams uh, with each team had its own mentor and uh, a cutting edge uh, Amazon Web Service um, server uh, dedicated for, for, their, uh, for their use. Um, and finally, sorry. And finally, uh, what did we achieve? This, this event, uh, okay was not just about the hackathon itself. It, it helped us to break the inter and intrasectorial data silos because we gave access to in-house uh, data uh, to, to the participants, to real data. We involved different business units and external companies. And also we raised a significant awareness on a, on a European level uh, about the, uh, the research output that we produce at EBITDA's project and also Telefonica research. Um, okay, these are some kind of related publications that were inspired, if not directly, indirectly by, by EBITDAS. And with this slide, I will conclude my presentation and um, have you take questions.
Uh, am I within the 30 minutes or am I? <laughs> great, great, Ioannis. Thank you so much for your great presentation. Uh, the questions will be answered at the end. So uh, yeah, please uh, pose your question at the Q&A panel. Uh, it's uh, time to move to the next uh, pilot, IBITES application to the manufacturing sector. Uh, Giuseppe Danilo Spenacchio will be our presenter. Uh, Danilo holds a master's degree in chemical engineering from Univers University Federico II of Naples in Italy. After attaining a master in automotive, uh, he joined the CRF as a researcher. His main research activities are on flexible and adaptive manufacturing to optimize industrial processes and improve their quality. And as mentioned as a member of the IBDAS team, Danilo is working on the manufacturing pilots. Danilo, the floor is yours. Thank you, Daphne, for your uh, introduction. Can you see the full screen? Yes. Okay, uh, after uh, banking and telecommunication uh, sectors, uh, now uh, I uh, will explain uh, uh, manufacturing use cases uh, and uh, how uh, IBDAS uh, developed uh, in, uh, innovative and interesting uh, solutions uh, for uh, our cases. In uh, the manufacturing uh, sector, uh, we uh, need to take into consideration uh, that uh, there are uh, many industries uh, that uh, uh, utilize uh, uh, several robots uh, and uh, digital tools uh, to uh, set and control uh, uh, production. In this way, uh, we, um, th these industries uh, generate a large amounts uh, of uh, raw uh, data. These uh, uh, data often are not uh, utilized uh, and uh, within uh, the IBDAS project, uh, we uh, want to demonstrate uh, how data can help uh, uh, manufacturers uh, to improve uh, uh, the robustness uh, and efficiency of uh, their project. For this, uh, we uh, identify two different uh, uh, scenarios uh, and uh, um, in which uh, data uh, structured and unstructured are uh, gathered from uh, real processes. In particular, uh, I describe the production process uh, of uh, aluminum decassing and the maintenance and monitoring of production assets. The first uh, for the quality improvement of the process and products, and the second for the uh, predictive uh, in maintenance. Our goal is to develop a methodology to propose to implement uh, in uh, other production sites. Uh, in uh, uh, manufacturing, as in other sectors, uh, uh, data are strictly uh, confidential. So uh, the first important uh, requirement is uh, the uh, data, data privacy. And uh, in fact, we uh, anonymize data that we received from the plant uh, and provide to the uh, platform. Uh, another important uh, aspect uh, is uh, um, the high uh, variety of uh, data that uh, uh, we can collect from real processes. Uh, and uh, uh, for this, uh, um, it is important to identify uh, incomplete, uh, inaccurate uh, and irrelevant parts uh, of the data. And uh, so another requirement is uh, the data, data cleaning. Uh, then uh, I uh, reported here uh, other three important uh, aspects, such as the uh, lack of time to extract and analyze data uh, due to the fast risk of production, fast internal change uh, due to uh, the rescheduling of uh, production quantities and component variation, and uh, um, the slowdown of data uh, sharing due to uh, internal security uh, procedures. So um, IBDAS uh, uh, solution, IBDAS platform, uh, it is an uh, uh, important uh, in aspect of data analytics uh, and also uh, for the advanced uh, visualization tools uh, that give us the uh, possibility uh, to uh, see uh, quickly what uh, is uh, happening. Uh, as I uh, said before, uh, our objective uh, are uh, two objectives are two: the quality improvement uh, in uh, one case uh, and the predictive uh, maintenance uh, in the uh, second. Uh, about the uh, production process uh, of uh, uh, die casting, uh, um, we uh, need to consider that uh, this is a very complex process uh, as uh, reported uh, in uh, literatures. We uh, have uh, a high variety of uh, uh, data uh, with uh, uh, low uh, veracity and uh, um, 
high uh, velocity because uh, every engine block uh, is produced every two uh, minutes, under two minutes. So uh, we have uh, heterogeneous uh, data uh, that has a uh, piston speed in the first and second phase and so on, and operator's data. Uh, because uh, there is also the uh, detection of uh, uh, defect uh, uh, manually. So uh, we fix uh, our business goal and use case goals. The uh, business goal is uh, to reduce uh, the um, scrape and waste uh, during production and uh, also to uh, prevent uh, um, replace and further processing. Uh, for uh, our business goal, uh, the use case goals uh, are in the development of high-level algorithms, the identification of critical uh, parameters, uh, and uh, um, a mode, uh, provide a mode to timely check the status of the process, uh, taking uh, into account the uh, quality levels that we uh, fix uh, as uh, key performance uh, indicators. The uh, production process of aluminum uh, the uh, casting, um, as I said, uh, is, is very complex. Uh, and uh, I uh, reported here a schematic diagram in which uh, you can see that uh, molten aluminum uh, is injected uh, in a deep cavity, and in output uh, we have uh, the engine uh, block. So uh, we have the opportunity to uh, collect uh, uh, many uh, that data. And uh, um, initially, uh, we uh, provided to the consortium uh, synthetic uh, data because uh, the um, anonymization process uh, took uh, uh, more time than expected. So uh, to start uh, for, with the implementation, we uh, utilize synthetic data and then uh, the anonymized data. In uh, this slide, I reported also the importance of to uh, break uh, data uh, silos because the uh, data are uh, um, generated uh, in the plant, uh, are uh, provided to uh, CRF um, for the anonymization and previous analysis, uh, and then to uh, the consortium. Uh, furthermore, we uh, integrate data from different levels uh, and sources, uh, and uh, in this case, we uh, involve the external and internal uh, departments. Uh, in the second part of the uh, project, uh, with the results that we uh, obtained, uh, we asked to, uh, the plant uh, to uh, introduce thermal cameras uh, for uh, other uh, uh, analysis. And uh, um, this uh, um, demonstrate uh, how it is important, uh, the um, flexibility of the uh, solution because uh, we can uh, ask uh, uh, more uh, analysis, uh, um, taking into account the evolution of the uh, project. In uh, this slide, uh, I uh, reported the uh, flow of data uh, from the plant to CRF to either until IBDAS platform. In uh, this uh, use case, we have a process thermal and quality data. They are uh, uh, provided from the plant to CRF, where we anonymize and collect the data and provide to the consortium, where uh, high-level algorithms are uh, developed uh, for this use case and uh, um, a good uh, visualization uh, uh, instrument for our uh, consideration. Now I'll share uh, the uh, demo. Do you see the screen? Yes, Danilo. After uh, uh, login uh, in uh, the IBDAS uh, platform, we can uh, select uh, the co-develop uh, mode uh, in which uh, we have uh, the hand-to-hand -hand solution for our use case. For the CRF uh, production uh, process, uh, we uh, have uh, a, a live chart. Data are coming uh, in uh, real time. So uh, we can uh, visualize uh, the parameters uh, that we uh, have identified as important for this use case. And uh, uh, as you can see uh, in uh, this chart, there are the last 20 uh, measurements. I can uh, deselect uh, or select boxes uh, if I want to see in particular some uh, parameters. And also if uh, I see something of anomalous, uh, I can uh, decide to uh, press on pause button and uh, then restart. 
uh, square the page uh, with the um, la global live chart, I have also the possibility to uh, visualize uh, the all information in a table. Um, in, um, uh, in the live chart and live production table, uh, we have uh, three uh, boxes related to the identification of the engine block. 17 important parameters, and at the end, the um, global uh, classification, the classification of uh, the uh, crankcase. In uh, the table in which we can read uh, the value of uh, parameters, we can uh, select uh, 5, 10, 25, or uh, 100 items uh, per page. In uh, then, we have also the uh, uh, possibility to uh, visualize the uh, percentage of the uh, classification uh, levels. Uh, we uh, fix uh, as KPIs for this uh, um, use case uh, three uh, quality, uh, three classification levels. One for the high quality and two for the lower quality. And thanks to uh, IBDAS platform, we test this solution and it is possible to increase the high quality and decrease the two lower uh, quality. We uh, can also visualize uh, the uh, statistic measurements of uh, uh, parameters. Uh, also in this case, uh, we can choose uh, uh, which parameter to visualize. And uh, um, in the end, I asked to, uh, the partner to uh, have the chance to visualize the classification level related to the engine blocks uh, with a chart and a table for a quickly uh, visualization. Then um, uh, some part in the, this part, uh, I can choose if visualize a global live chart with all three classification levels or classification level zero that we identified important for our investigations. Coming back to the presentation, I pass to the next, uh, the, um, the other use case, maintenance and monitoring of production assets. In this case, uh, we have data collected from sensors mounted on uh, different uh, machines. And uh, the business goal uh, is uh, the uh, predictive uh, maintenance because uh, in uh, many industrial processes, uh, it is uh, important to uh, have the possibility to predict faults before they happen or to predict uh, unnecessary actions uh, in order to avoid the uh, micro or uh, macro stoppages. Uh, and uh, for these business goal, uh, goals, uh, uh, the use case goals uh, are reported here uh, and it's to collect the structure and uh, analyze sensor data uh, with high level algorithm. In this case, uh, IBD has um, developed an anomaly detection model to uh, identify the anomalous uh, measurement uh, for uh, the sensors, and uh, we asked uh, to IBDAS Consortium to uh, create a um, structured foundational database uh, uh, in order to have the history of the anomalous uh, trend, all of these uh, uh, for planning the uh, maintenance. The uh, data set that we um, provide in this, uh, in this case uh, are two. We uh, provide uh, anonymized SCADA data and anonymized MES data. The first, in the first, uh, there are value for uh, each category of sensors. Uh, for example, uh, for uh, uh, the accelerometers, uh, we uh, can monitor the vibration uh, on the uh, machine and uh, uh, analyze uh, their trend uh, um, allows us to uh, predict the onset of deterioration. Uh, only all of these uh, to have the possibility to intervene in time before uh, the failure. MES uh, uh, data are useful for the identification of the type of uh, vehicles on the production line when uh, there are produced different types of uh, vehicles. MES uh, um, data uh, showed uh, during the analysis uh, high variance in measurement, and uh, uh, also we have some uh, um, issues uh, due to the lackness of MES uh, data. 
uh, because of uh, rescheduling activities uh, and uh, minor change in production lines, uh, partially due uh, to the COVID-19 uh, situation. But uh, thanks to uh, IBDAS uh, analysts, uh, we uh, found relevant, uh, relevant information in uh, SCADA uh, data for uh, our uh, objectives. Also, in this uh, case, uh, um, the flow is uh, the same of the uh, aluminum die casting uh, uh, process. Uh, now, I'll uh, show the demo for this uh, use case the CRF maintenance and monitoring of uh, production uh, assets. Uh, as uh, I uh, said uh, before, uh, we uh, asked to IBDAS consortium to um, create a um, database with the history of the anomalies. And uh, as you uh, can see, uh, we can choose uh, the year, For example, to the main, and uh, in uh, this slide uh, you can uh, visualize all sensors uh, categories uh, uh, that report uh, acceleration, velocity, temperature, pressures, flow, uh, displacement, uh, and energy uh, vectors. If I uh, select, for example, uh, the A uh, tab, we can uh, visualize uh, all uh, accelerometers. Uh, Classified, uh, classified with an ID uh, number. And uh, in red color, uh, we see the uh, corresponding uh, accelerometer with uh, anomaly strand, in blue without anomaly strand. For example, if I select 17, I can uh, see a bar chart uh, in which I can uh, visualize uh, the trend of uh, anomalies uh, during the month uh, for all uh, days, and I can uh, select a bar, uh, a bar and uh, visualize the corresponding sensor mean value and uh, the anomalies reported with the time stamp. This uh, for uh, the second uh, use case. Going back to uh, the uh, presentation, I uh, reported here the benefits from uh, IBDAS uh, project. We identified for both uh, use cases uh, different KPI. For the first uh, use case, three uh, quality levels. Uh, and for the second, uh, the overall uh, equipment effectiveness uh, and uh, the maintenance cost. We uh, tested that with the IBDA solution, it is possible uh, to uh, increase the quality level of the uh, production process uh, uh, and products uh, for the aluminum decasting and also uh, decrease uh, the lower levels. For the uh, second use case, um, it is uh, impossible. To, it is possible, uh, sorry, to uh, increase uh, um, the current value of uh, overall uh, equipment effectiveness, and uh, so uh, decrease the value of the maintenance uh, cost. Another important aspect uh, is that uh, with the real stream, with the streaming analytics for the, the um, first use case. Uh, uh, we uh, reduce the uh, time to uh, produce uh, decisions uh, because uh, uh, we uh, received uh, um, answer results in a few uh, seconds uh, and uh, we um, have the uh, possibility to uh, choose how to uh, act on the process or products. So uh, we uh, reduce time from one month to a few hours or a job of work, a kind of job, or uh, one day. And the um, accuracy uh, achieved within IBDAS is increased. Also, uh, in the manufacturing case, uh, in uh, June 2019, we organized uh, in a hackathon in the south uh, of uh, Italy. In this hackathon, students, PhD researchers, and employees uh, from small medium enterprise uh, have been uh, involved. And uh, uh, with the results that we obtained from the, these uh, events, uh, we uh, improve, uh, we further improve our uh, study and analysis on the uh, aluminum die casting uh, use case. 
In the end, uh, I uh, reported uh, here a summary of the best practices uh, that uh, uh, we uh, learned uh, within uh, IBDAS, starting uh, from the uh, generation extraction of the data until to the visualization of the results. And uh, um, as the first uh, point uh, is very important, uh, data ingestion and data uh, management, because uh, we uh, collected data from different sources and different uh, levels. And we need to extract value in all information that uh, we have uh, available. Uh, for uh, this, uh, we involved different departments uh, belonging uh, um, to uh, the plant and CRF, and also we uh, continuously interacted uh, with the uh, uh, IBDAS uh, partners. As I said uh, um, before, uh, other important um, uh, best practices are data cleaning. Uh, for the identification of incomplete, inaccurate, and irrelevant parts, and the uh, fabrication of realistic synthetic uh, data in the preliminary uh, stage. Uh, furthermore, uh, we uh, analyze uh, the first use case in stream analytic and the second in batch, because uh, uh, for uh, these um, we uh, can uh, we need to take into account that there are uh, cases um, that uh, require a deeper analysis of uh, a large amount of data uh, collected over uh, a period of time such as in case of the maintenance and monitoring of production assets. And uh, in other uh, cases, uh, um, the velocity and agility of the uh, results are uh, um, important uh, for uh, the uh, rescheduling uh, quickly the production uh, process. Uh, such as in the first uh, use case. Thanks to uh, EBDAS, uh, we uh, also have the possibility to utilize an infrastructure. This is another important aspect uh, because uh, many industries don't um, have uh, infrastructure for the analytics uh, and uh, often uh, there are uh, um, uh, internal uh, constraints that don't uh, allow to uh, share uh, data or to give uh, access to internal uh, uh, servers. Uh, uh, we, uh, with uh, both use cases, uh, we uh, create uh, an iterative uh, process for the data collection and uh, a flexible uh, for the uh, retrieving of uh, data uh, under unexpected uh, condition. And uh, as I show in the demo, we uh, can visualize the result in uh, a simply intuitive and effective uh, mode. And uh, it is very important uh, for uh, our and users. In conclusion, uh, thanks to uh, specialists uh, and uh, competencies, uh, we uh, discovered uh, new information from data that we uh, collected. Uh, and uh, thanks to IBDAS platform, uh, we identify partners, uh, uh, important partners uh, uh, to uh, improve uh, uh, processes uh, and uh, uh, new digital services uh, in our uh, sectors. So uh, as a service, uh, IBDAS platform um, has the possibility to empower uh, expert non expert users uh, of uh, huge quantities of uh, data uh, and uh, give us the possibility to analyze data in real or near real time. And uh, uh, new competencies uh, have been included in data analysis. Thank you all uh, for your attention and uh, a special thanks um, to all IBDAS partners for uh, the uh, high human value of uh, each people uh, that is working in this project. Thank you, great. Thank you, Danilo, for your great presentation. Uh, don't forget to, to post your questions for Danilo. Uh, let's move on to the next. Uh, uh, presentation. Uh, Dr. Vasilis Hadzianakis is going to demonstrate the IPDAS platform. Um, introduction before that, uh, Dr. Hadzianakis received his PhD and his bachelor's degree in electrical and computer engineering, both from the National Technical University of Athens. He is currently a technical manager at IT Ameri. 
He has also worked in the network operation centers in NTUA and Interest of International. His research interests revolve around cybersecurity, machine learning, and distributed systems. But Vasilis is the IBD integration manager. Vasilis, the floor is yours. Thank you, Vespina. Hello, all. I will proceed with a demonstration of the IBDES platform. Uh, first of all, I would like uh, to summarize again uh, the functionality that we have integrated in, in the platform. You can see here, uh, this is the dashboard, uh, the main uh, page after launching into the, to the platform. And there are uh, three available modes there. The expert mode, uh, his essence uh, allows, allows Python developers with ML expertise to upload their own data and uh, run their experiments. And to help uh, all, uh, all this process, we, have, uh, we provide some uh, templates that they can use to, you know, to, to start, uh, to kickstart uh, the, the code development. Um, the self-service mode uh, targets people that are in, actually have the domain knowledge and some insights about data analysis, uh, but are not developers, uh, to, to easily run analytics uh, tasks in a user-friendly way. And for that manner, also have a, a, a wizard that can help them select between available algorithms in the platform. Finally, the code develop mode, uh, which I'm going to, to briefly show you now. Uh, this in includes all the, all the specific uh, use cases that we implemented in, uh, in Abidas. In, in our cases, we call them Abidas use cases. And uh, these are, you know, these all include use cases provided by CAIXA, CRF, and Telefonica and have uh, machine learning algorithms and visualizations that are tailor-made to their needs. Now, uh, moving back to the, to the self-service mode, here you, you see that there is a, a list of available algorithms that we have uh, prepared as a proof of concept. Uh, so a user that comes here is assisted uh, by the by this wizard to 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 select a recommended algorithm. Let's say, for example, that we have a user that with a, with a CSV file uh, for it for their data set, and they want to analyze it in an unsupervised manner. So what would uh, they do is uh, start the wizard, uh, select if they have you know uh, labeled values in their data set, meaning this, this help them distinguish between the supervised and unsupervised algorithm. In our case, it's no. Uh, some value about the, the data set size. Uh, then they select if they need a, a temporary analysis, uh, if their data set should be treated at time, as a time series or not. And uh, then uh, a, a question about the feature importance. And finally, they get a recommendation. In our case, uh, we have implemented the K-means algorithm and we proposed to the user to use it to make an initial clustering of their data set. So if we go to, to K-means, which is a the most common algorithm for an um, supervised machine learning. We see here uh, that the user can create a new experiment. Uh, here they would add uh, a name for the experiment and select one of, of a data set that has been already uploaded by them. For example, this one then decide on uh, and, and, you, and you get a preview of, of the data set that we have selected. This is a simple data set uh, containing uh, coordinates. And then uh, they should enter the number of clusters they want to, to you know, to, 
for the algorithm, you know, and, and then and there are some, a few more parameters that are specific to the algorithms, like uh, the number of uh, uh, maximum repetition or how the data set should be uh, treated and uh, the portion of, of the data set used for uh, uh, training and for validation and stuff like that. And then then can select the computational resources and start the analysis. So, if we see uh, an existing experiment, this one, for example, you see here that uh, the options that the user entered, and there is also a visualization showing the, the three clusters that were uh, created in a 2D space, and also more generic information about the the points uh, that were, uh, you know, included in, in every cluster. And finally, the user has the, the ability to download the file, the a file containing all this information. We have that in a JSON format and uh, they can further analyze it. So this is example of, of an of self-service mode. Uh, apart from the k-means, we also have uh, uh, Lasso ADMM, which is a logistic regression algorithm, an ensemble of the random forests in here, and also a, a simple model, uh, a decision tree implementation. Now, moving on to the expert mode. So here, uh, the user has uh, the ability to create a new project and upload their own code. So here you see that select and create a new project. Uh, so user specifies the name, the, num uh, the type, a small description, uh, batch processing with a default, the input selection, whether they can, they will also upload a, a file with it or use a, data, a table in the database, or maybe nothing at all, then the, the algorithm will, will use its own uh, input as data. And then there is uh, the ability to use either the, the default Docker image. So a few words about that. So to, in order to implement uh, the expert model on the other use cases, we, we created a, a technology based on Docker where every user, when a, a new experiment is created, a new uh, Docker environment is created and all the experiments run in a secure and isolated environment, not interfering we know, with, each, uh, with each other's experiments and files. And uh, to spin up these uh, containers around the experiments, we use either a default Docker image that contains all the algorithms and uh, libraries that were uh, created within the IBDAS project and is also available now in, in Docker Hub or the user can decide to upload their own Docker image with some specific code and libraries used. Apart from uh, the Docker image that contains all the algorithms that are available in, in uh, in IBDAS, we also have two templates. The user can download these templates, uh, edit them, and upload their own version. And we have two examples, one for a uh, logistic regression and one for uh, decision uh, for random forest. So at this point, I will uh, switch on to a video showing showing how the uh, expert mode works and also uh, there is uh, also we can see also what's happening in the background now you see here that uh, we start by adding simple details Uh, Vasily, I yes. think we we see uh, again the, the screen of the ABDA solution we cannot see the video yet You don't see the video? At least, no. 
Okay. Wait, uh, one moment. Yes, I think it's better. Can you see the video yes. now? Yes, now okay. I can see it. Yeah, I don't know what happened before. Anyway. So we see here the user entering some initial uh, example. In this use case, we will, we will demonstrate the use of a, a program called uh, SimplePy. It's, it's a small Python program that corresponds to the, to the Hello World uh, equivalent in, uh, in, in, in IBDAS and COMS, the technology that is used in, uh, in IBDAS. You see here, it, it's a small script what happens in this, in essence, is that uh, there is an initialization of a counter, and all workers running in this, uh, running this experiment, uh, communicate, share the initial number, and then increase by one and, and uh, report it. So we see here using the default Docker image, we're sending, uh, and for the new project, we can run one or multiple experiments every time we can change the, the specific command give some other input and rerun the experiment and now you can see in the right hand side in the terminal um, there is a file being created there with all the output from, uh, there is a new network created in, in the Docker Swarm that supports the, the experiment. The, there are two workers created in this case, uh, run, and, and then we can check out the output in the equivalent file, which is also downloadable for the user, you know, to get all the application output and, uh, and get the results. And so between the debugging messages, you can see the initial counter, which is 10, and then the final counter, which is increased by one, and it's 11 here. So uh, after the user has uh, finished their experiment, they can see uh, the results, they can download it. So we, if, for example, you go to the expert mode, uh, you've seen here before, uh, Ramon uh, showed how uh, we, we created a custom experiment for the uh, Kaixa bank transfer. And, uh, and there is also the ability to visualize the output using a custom visualization called Voila that was also uh, uh, implemented within IBDAS. And the idea is here that the user can upload their own visualization code in form of a Jupyter Notebook in Python. So this is all from my side. Thank you all. Thank you, Vespina. Great, great, Vasilis. Thank you for your great presentation. Uh, okay, it's time to move to our last uh, session. I hope you will have uh, 15 more time, 15 minutes more to devote on us. Uh, it's very interesting, the, the business offering of the IBDA solution uh, by Dr. Hernan Ruiz Ocampo. Uh, Hernan is a project manager and a research fellow at the Circular Economy Research Center at the Col de Pont Business School in Paris. Hernan obtained uh, his uh, PhD in process and bioprocess engineering at the Institute Mines Telecom Atlantic in Nantes in France. And in uh, 2019, he graduated from an MBA in innovation management from a Col de Pont. Uh, Hernan's research uh, currently focuses in the field of circular economy. Uh, he's a member of the work package that is leading the exploitation, sustainability, and business continuity activities of the IBDA solution. Uh, Hernan, the floor is yours. Okay. Thank you, Despina. I will start sharing my, my screen.
Can you see my screen? Yes. Okay. We just. Okay. So, thank you, Despina, for the introduction. And now let's add some South American flavor to this last presentation of the day. So, my name is Hernan. I'm from Bolivia, and I will present the Ibidas business and commercial offering. The presentation will include the dissemination activities, the commercial offering, the market trends and business modeling financial forecast, and the long-term sustainability. It is essential to highlight that uh, dissemination activities supported the definition of target audiences and stakeholders to enhance, to enhance the IVDA outcomes. And uh, regarding the IVDA's commercialization offering, we believe that we are creating a unique product that allows large, small, and medium-sized companies to incorporate big data analytics into their business decision. And we had the opportunity to confirm it by developing use cases in three crucial sectors. So banking represented by, by Kaixa Bank, telecommunication represented by Telefonica, and the manufacturing industry represented by the automotive sector with CRF. Our mission is to unleash the value of big data. And in that way, support the digital single market strategy, the European data economy, and to contribute to the EU purpose to become a global leader in accelerating digital transformation and to Europe's determination in transitioning to circular industries. In that sense, uh, one of our part of the work was the, in, in which we performed a SWOT analysis to evaluate the, the strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats that the IBIDA solution may have. Some of the strengths are the flexibility and modular architecture, which aims to empower end users and unlocking data silos, to mention just a few. Regarding the possible threats, we can mention that we are not the only platform that wants to penetrate the data market. And there are many competitors developing big data analytics. Also, there is a lack of data evaluation standards in marketplaces, as well as restrictions in data sharing ability. Because we are shifting towards a data driven, towards a data driven socioeconomic model, big data is a promising sector and the market trends are in our favor. As you can see, the graph shows the forecast of the revenue of big data worldwide, which will experiment a continuous increase in the coming years. And there will be about $50 billion market between 2020 and 2027 worldwide. Moreover, the share of big data and business analytics revenue worldwide by industries in 2019 show a significant percentage in the industries in which IBIDA has developed its use cases, such as banking and manufacturing. So this shows the, the, the potential of the development of the IBIDA solution. To validate the IBIDA's features and their relevance in the market, we use digital marketing tools like chatbots and online questionnaires, funding that the most relevant customers' needs in business performances are, as you can see in this graph, the improvement of the product and service quality, followed by time efficiency and cost reduction. Regarding the capabilities, the most relevant are the increase of the speed on data analysis, a self-service solution, a safe environment, and agility. The most relevant platform characteristics that were identified are the advanced visualization, batch analytics, followed by the support to developers and non-IT experts, and, and stream analytics. And finally, the solutions most relevant services are linked to time efficiency, accuracy, and reliability of the analytical process, and big data user productivity. So the results helped us to refine the different characteristics and user modes that the platform can offer. Moreover, to guarantee maximum adaptability to the fast-paced change in the big data analytics environment, we use a lean innovation and agility approach for the business modeling 
developed at the Col de Pont Business School, which enabled the development of the costume, the product, and the business uh, model at the same time. Therefore, we use a dynamic business model worksheet composed of 12 elements, which follows a logical path covering all aspects that enable to determine the customer experience, the market and strategy, and the financial plan, including the income statement, the balance, the balance sheet, and the cash flow statement. The complete worksheet of the is shown in this slide. In, and it helps us to build a sound business plan for potential commercialization of the IVIDA solution. Thus, the IVIDA's value proposition offers a user-friendly interface for IT experts and non-experts that helps to save time by increasing the speed of data analytics, but also to save money with less expensive data analytics. And finally, it supports the upskilling of your team, empowering employees with the right knowledge for decision making. The Vidas platform can be deployed on the cloud or on premises. It targets IT developers and not IT users. The services are mainly based on, on batch processing and stream analytics under three modes self deliveries, co develop, and expert like was described in the previous presentation by Vasilis. And the platform allows users to select algorithms. It creates visualizations, provided the possibility to extract business insights as, as shown by the demos. The Ibidas platform and its tools will be released under an open source license, allowing the source code to be used, modified, or shared under defined terms and conditions. The potential commercialization includes a license fee through an annual or a monthly subscription aiming to target all size of companies by giving flexible pricing. Besides the offer, besides the offer can include consultancy services for tailor-made solution as shown by the different use cases presented before. For the potential commercialization of the solution, uh, we based uh, we use a forecast analysis based in uh, four years, in which we consider the forecast of the number of companies data users in the EU, in the European Union, and the United Kingdom until 2025, reported in the European Data Market Moni Monitoring Tool, including three different scenarios, as you can see here in the figure. So, this is also related with the report that Nuria. Uh, show it yeah, at the beginning of the, of, the, of, the, of the event. So thus the total addressable market in Europe will be between 27 and 120,000 companies by 2025. And our forecast considers an increase in the number of customers reaching more than 30 companies by 2024. That is the target, which represents a market share between 0.3 if we consider the high growth scenario and 1.2 of data users companies if we consider the challenge scenario, which you show in the figure. Our clients for further sorry, sorry, for further commercialization of the Vida solution, the customers are clearly identified and the strategy unfolds in three steps. The first step is to consider the industrial partners of the Ibida solutions as innovators by implementing the platform on their premises, thus being the example for other companies in the same industries to adopt the solution. The second step is to extend the market and reach similar industries such as financial institutions, manufacturing companies in general, and service and infrastructure providers as early adopters. And finally, when the solution will be mature enough, we will open the market to new industries such as retail or healthcare, among others. Regarding our financial projection, this uh, graph is expressed in thousands. And according to our conservative uh, projection, our revenue as well as the net profit will steadily increase over the next years. As you can see here in year 2021, there will be a negative net profit 
which is normal because we will, in a, we will be in an early stage of development phase. Nevertheless, the target is to have a positive figure as from the second year, as you can see here. And in the last year of forecast, which is uh, 2024, there will be a net income higher than 1 million euros, as we can see in this slide here. So this also shows the great potential of developing a big data analytic solutions like ideas. To achieve the, the projection showed in the financial forecast, the technology readiness level or TRL of the platform need to be continuously developed. Therefore, the path for long-term for long-term sustainability consider first the, the establishment of synergies between the different partners of the project, which develops the core technologies of the architecture and which are divided in batch processing and stream analytics according to the different use cases and the services developed during the project. At the same time, as Dusa mentioned also early this morning, it is worth mentioning that the IDAS ecosystem contributed to the development and the emergence of a spin-off from our partner uh, Barcelona BSC. So the spin-off is part of the innovations mentioned by Dusan from the project identified by the EU radar. And now it's also in the BDVA marketplace, as well as the other innovations presented in, in, in his presentation. Thus, we want to take a bit of time to highlight uh, the, that uh, Cubit, Cubist sorry, is ready to go to the market and they started their commercial activities this year. So Cubist, aims to save time and money of computing data and helps to get the results needed by accessing only a fraction of the data. As I mentioned before, Cubist is a patented technology of, uh, from Barcelona Supercomputing and their storage accelerator is based on a multidimensional indexing and sampling technology, which allows to have three, three times more productive data teams up to 100 fast, faster data analysis. Their value, their value is that they use advanced machine learning tools for the whole organization and also allows to, co to cost savings by pay only for the data analyzed. The technology aims to help data scientists and data engineers and the early adopters, the, the early adopters targeted targeted are enterprise Spark users. So if you want to have more information about uh, this, uh, this technology, you can visit their website at Cubist.io. So the path, for, the path forward uh, long-term sustainability and coming back to the long-term sustainability uh, of the project regarding the industrial sectors, that uh, are included in our project. So first, we want to present the strategy of the banking sector. CAIXA is proposed a garage lab that will be deployed at the Department of Information Security during the first semester of 2021. This infrastructure is a sandbox specialized designed to evaluate innovative tools integration into day-to-day -day operations of the digital security department. The strategy is divided in three main steps, which includes the first, that the CAIXA Digital Security Department will continue having access to the IVDAS environment and extract the information required from the, from the use cases for evaluation. So the second step is the IVDAS solution will be deployed in this garage lab, as I mentioned before, to evaluate the outcomes of the tool and if the evaluation is successful, so the potential achievements are linked to the integration of the IBIDA solution in CAIXA's premises by defining the go a governance model of the tool to be used in the departments in order to experiment with, different, with the different use cases. Regarding the telecommunication sector, the aim is to present the IVIDA solution to Telefonica's internal innovation calls during the second quarter of 2021. If the IVIDA solution is selected, it could be implemented in Telefonica's sandboxes to accelerate its development by working with Telefonica and its partners to validate the solution with the users 
and to access Telefonica network and systems lab, and finally to access to live trials with Telefonica customers to validate the IVIDA solution to accelerate commercial, technical, and, operate, and operational validation. And finally, the path forward the manufacturing sector is that the CRF plans to organize training sessions with end users after the end of the project, so next year, and to foster the development of a big data culture. The training will include process, engine, process and engineers, technicians involved in data collection or data security, or, or data security and operators employed at different levels on the production lines. The strategy in this case is to present the use cases, the type of data collected and the management of data to perform the analysis. Then to show and explain step by step the IDIDAS platform with an, in, a, with an interactive session to test the different features for with the employees. And finally, as a, as a potential achievement is to integrate the IDIDA solution inside CRF premises and implement circular business models that ultimates drive long-term value creation. So the circular business model identified for the CRF uh, use case is it's called product life extension. So product life extension enables companies to extend the life cycle of products and assets. So value that, that would otherwise be lost through wasted materials is instead maintained or even improved. So here, I will recall the, the business KPIs that were presented by Danilo, and, and which, uh, which aims to increase the index of overall equipment effect effectiveness by one to 1.5. Also, the cost reduction by decreasing of 20 to 30% the maintenance cost. The job per hour index from one month to few hours and also the quality levels by increase of three to 7% of good products and to decrease of one to four and 0.5 to two, the defective products. So if you are, interest, if you are interested to know more about the Vida solution or you want to explore possible co collaboration with the project, you can contact our team by visiting Ivida's website at ividas.eu or by visiting our social media. We are present in Twitter, in LinkedIn, but also in, in, uh, in YouTube. And you can also send us an email to these uh, three different addresses that uh, shows in this slide. So with this, I would like to thank for your attention and in name of the World Packet 17, and the IVDAS Consortium, we would like to wish you a Merry Christmas and a Happy New Year. And uh, go back to you, Despina. Great, great, Hernan. Thank you so much for your great presentation. Um, I think that all the questions have been already replied by our speakers. And since we are already delayed, I would like now ask the IVDAS project coordinator uh, to close uh, this event. So, Thierry. Thank you, Despina. Uh, Thank you for uh, running this whole event. Uh, I think Nuri is not with us anymore, so uh, she's not here to, to, so I can thank her. I'll send her an email afterwards. She gave a very interesting talk. Uh, I'd like to thank everyone that participated. I mean, it's been a, you know, uh, it's been a long day. Uh, I hope everyone got a better idea of what we've been doing over the last few years and uh, maybe also some hints about things that we'll be doing in the future as well. So with this, I'd like to close this event and thank you all for attending. Thank you. Bye-bye.